welcome to Varm Blog, and today I'm talking with friend of the show, Jules, Julian, um, Catholic Claude, he goes by many names, um, our favorite Catholic Marxist, uh, which there aren't a lot of who don't work for Compact Magazine. Oh. Um, so, uh, we are going to talk today about Marxist feminism, and I wanted to cover this for a variety of reasons. Now, this probably won't come out till December, uh, but I'm going to de- I'm going to deliberately date my show. Uh, and for those listening on audio, you'll probably get it at the beginning of next year because I have that much of a backlog. But this is the this is a few days before the primaries. Uh, excuse me, not the primaries. The midterms um, in 2022. And the family has been back on the topic of conversation, given the wars of school boards and the activiz- and the activization of a bunch of activist women, uh, moms groups primarily, who uh, are portraying trans and uh, LGBTQ issues as a threat to their way of life. Um, and one of the One of the things that I, you know, you and I have had a critical engagement with Christopher Lash and uh, Lash actually is probably what inspired both of us to talk about this topic um, because this is the area in which I think you and I disagree the most with most of Lash's conclusions, but actually agree with one thing he asserts, and that is capitalism probably more than any other force. Uh, was both dividing up and reconstitution, reconstituting, and also in some ways saving elements of, but then destroying selectively uh, the family as it was understood before the 20th century. Um, and I think it's important to conceptualize this, though, because the destruction of the family as it was understood needs to be, one, historicized in that the, the nuclear family divorced from extended relatives and a larger community is a relatively modern phenomenon. Um, you do see it develop, and ironically, Lash's own early work actually indicates this, but, but again, I, I promise we're going to Lash thing today. It's just, uh, this is the, the part where I have to do a whole lot of research to engage with, with him. Uh, Lash's own research indicates that the, it was out of bourgeois and former aristocratic families where the idea of the alienated wife, you know, particularly being resettled out West was a, was the origins of a lot of the notions of the nuclear family. It's also a lot of the the origins of like activist women um, because they have excess leisure time because they're removed from community labor and, and whatnot really comes into focus. Now, I'm giving all this history because I think some things that we're going to be dealing with here is is difficult. Um, one of the things that I I have been engaging with people like the Class Unity Caucus, um, which I think you and I both have friends in, you know, so yeah. they're not enemies. Um, with the thinkers like Christopher Wright, um, and. You know, even in even when we talk about Christopher Lash, you know, I understand why feminists have a problem with Christopher Lash. Like, uh, I don't understand why feminists don't have more of a problem with Nietzsche, but that's a whole nother question. Um, and probably shouldn't be generalized about anyway. But I have to admit that for a lot of the 20th century, like you could be good on indigenous rights or African American rights, you could be good on uh, the civil rights movement. Or the women's movement, but rarely did you find thinkers until like the 1980s who were consistently good on both. Right. Um, I mean, this is this is an important point actually. Uh, when Daniel Patrick Moynihan published his book on the disintegrating uh, African American family in like the urban ghettos, like some of the most positive uh, leaders of the black community, look, some of the most positive people on results of the study were people like MLK and Malcolm X, because they were also concerned with the perception of the disintegration of the black family, albeit they disagree with a lot of Moynihan's conclusions about like 
it coming down to morality or like it being like oh it's just merely economic kind of forces that are like shattering the black family etc cetera, etc cetera, mm -hmm. your point i mean it, it <laughs> the monahan report you talk about economic forces shattering the black family and it doesn't talk about mass incarceration enough or mm -hmm. talks about it solely as a result of not as a cost for um uh, and and you know that gave us a whole decade of people who could use coded cultural critiques as racial critiques including a lot of um black male leaders i mean you're right malcolm x particularly uh, mlk was not a whole lot better and it's important to remember they both came out of fairly conservative religious communities right. even if they were not politically conservative um Although with Malcolm X, that's a much more difficult, uh, his exact politics are all over the map, actually. Um, you know, his, uh, his conversion to Sunni Islam and his general support of socialism as opposed to black entrepreneurialism is really, really, you know, happens about the same time and very late. Yeah, um, it, doesn't have, it doesn't come in, the, especially the more ardent stance against capitalism doesn't happen until like after he comes back from Mecca and like shortly before his death. So, yeah. And it's not really represented in the Alex Haley biography because Alex Haley was a Knicksonite. So it's, <laughs> um, I mean, true facts. Like right. it, it's, it, it's something to really kind of parse conversely. Um, it is also true that the women's movement, have been pretty terrible historically on racial issues in ways that I see liberals today try to avoid uh, or try to spin. <laughs> like, oh, um, yeah, like this is a really important point, especially when it comes to the rights of domestic workers in like the South, because most of most domestic workers back then were black women. And while you had like women who are working as like laborers and trying to unionize, like very oftentimes, and especially with white women, they were very like ambivalent or even in opposition to a lot of the unionization efforts of like domestic domestic workers in places like Alabama, Louisiana and South Carolina. Yeah, so it, it, I think the reason why intersectionality had such a pull when Crenshaw came up with the term in the 80s and was already really beginning to be dealt with uh, as a kind of result of the new left. We tend to write that off. I mean, literally, I have people who tell me it was an op like to divide up the working class. I remember um, when I was uh, getting up in like my introduction to like leftism and being on like the very class first sort of like forums and them also repeating that talking point that it was like a fed and op, like that sort of stuff. And I, I have always rejected that actually, which is, is funny because I'm sympathetic to class first analysis, um, but I'm sympathetic to class first analysis if you actually also look through the way that that generated racial and gender divides. Right. Um, like, this comes especially into like analysis of uh, analyzing the political economy of the ghetto. Cause when mm -hmm. you're coming from like a, a very vulgar class first kind of Marxism, your assumption is that like, Oh, like people in the ghetto are being exploited by like a sort of like, uh, color, like color non-bias of like whether black or white, or like the the equivalent they, they equivocate like black banks or black businessmen in the ghetto with like white businessmen and white bankers but you see like a lot of scholarship that says like yeah even though like many of these individuals in like these in like these ghettos are like very like predatory and they do get a lot of money in they by virtue of the insecure like how insecure it is like doing business in the in like a low income black neighborhood because of a lot of different factors, like people not being able to pay like their debts, that sort of thing. Like many of these operators often have to use, like they're, they're often operating off of like much higher operating costs because they have to employ more labor in order to extract that money. So like, even like yeah. when we talk about that, like there isn't like an equivalence between white capitalists and black capitalists. There's like there's a gradient even within that class.
It's interesting because I, I tend to defend Adolf Reed on his analysis if I don't always agree with how he employs it. But on this, I actually tend to think he's more nuanced than his fans realize. Hmm. Um uh, because he does point out that, that there was a difference between, say, the fact that you can talk about a black elite and a black bourgeoisie versus a white one actually indicates that there is a distinction and it is not just a fabricated distinction via race. Mm -hmm. It is also true that a lot of our discourse today, and I think this is where we're going to have to really kind of get into the family, but we have to kind of come at it as skewed from talk, like dealing with the race question that a lot of our discourse today around race is used the way Adolf Reed and Co. describe, which is to erase distinctions between social classes or even, frankly, different ethnicities um, mm -hmm. in sub demographics. You know, um, my, my favorite one is is. How do you explain if there's more minority acceptances into Harvard than ever, how the class basis of Harvard is actually more exclusive than it was 20 years ago than, it, than, than today? I think I see where you're going with this one, yeah. Right. Well, it, it's, the answer is simple. It's immigrants. Yeah. No, yeah. Like, it's it's uh, Nigerians who migrate to America, and they tend to be like the wealthiest like demographic of immigrants. And so places like Yale, where I went to, um, the black population, the black students who go to Yale tend to have a very large disproportionate share who are like the, the children of like wealthy professional immigrants. Right. Whereas, and they're like, even yeah. wealthier than which than their white counterparts. But that is fueling a misunderstanding of what is happening in the black community as a whole. And it's also a fueling reactionary and, and some of these things are tied into the family and I it can go into this discourses reactionary discourses in black political spaces mm. against immigrants because they see that they're not benefiting from these policies um, they're disproportionately saddled with student debt uh, but then so are women although then you have to admit that there's been a fundamental change in the workforce because the reason why there's more women saddled with student debt it's because there's more women entering university, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, one, of, one of the more interesting points to kind of bring it to the family uh, that Melinda Cooper talks about is like the rise of, of student debt from the 70s onwards as a means of like disciplining young students and tying them more closely to the finances of their parents. Uh, one of the interesting points that uh, Cooper brings up in her book, uh, I think it was Family yeah, Values. This was a nightmare for me personally 20 years ago when I couldn't like it wasn't just they tied it financially to my parents. They wanted me to disclose the financial status of my father on my FOSFA mm. and my father was MIA. Yeah, same like, with my mom. I couldn't because I can't I couldn't track down my biological mom so I couldn't exactly put her down there on my FAFSA. Right. Um, and, and they kept on pushing back on me, claiming my stepfather, who I was actually better, more well off than my father, but they didn't care um, uh, because um, he did not adopt me because my father wasn't around to let him. So it was it was uh, um, a very funny situation. Right. And, and that Melinda Cooper book really spoke to me because I started seeing how during the neoliberal period. We used families in ways that were that was really pernicious because it also makes people like me distrustful of government programs. Yeah. Because it ties them to our family and we feel punished by that, even if we were not, even if we didn't benefit financially from our family's wealth. Right. Um, and my family didn't have a lot of wealth, but still. Right. One of the most interesting lights that, one of the most interesting insights from that book is a, uh, Cooper talking about the the discourse in like California when Reagan was running for governor, where Reagan Reagan posited his opposition to Pell grants and federal and state aid to like low income students coming to these universities in terms of look at all these riots that are happening at UC Berkeley and these other schools. It's because these children have been spoiled, uh, and like the only way to like get them to like not be spoiled is to treat them like children to act as parents and to like basically uh, uh, stop giving them as much aid to just do whatever 
uh, on these college campuses. So Cooper makes this very interesting argument where she talks about the rise of student debt, like not primarily as, but as like one of the effects being like a means of, of uh, neutralizing a lot of the student protests in the late 60s and early 70s. Mm. I think this is a uh, this is something really to think about. I, I I have reached out to Melinda Cooper, and and I think uh, Melinda Cooper has another book coming out, and so she's not doing speaking engagements. But I think once her new book comes out, or at least she's finished with it, and it's in the hands of an editor, uh, she'll come on the show. She indicated that she was interested. Mm. Um, I find that Cooper book to be fascinating because it's both a rejoinder to, as we mentioned in our podcast on Lash, and anytime you and I get together, it feels like it's the ghost of Wallerstein and the ghost of Christopher Lash hanging over <laughs> our backs. Um, uh, the, it's a good rejoinder to a lot of Lash's claims, but I also find it interesting because it proves some of what Lash's concerns were simultaneously. And that is the weaponization of the family is also kind of weirdly dependent on this dissolution for certain yeah. people making family life again a classed good and we oh, see yeah. this in marriage rates oh yeah like um ruth wilson gilmore she has a very good uh she puts a very good label on what you're talking about uh she calls it the anti-state state where you mm -hmm. have politicians like during the neoliberal era or the dawn of it campaigning on um uh, getting the state out of your life uh which as time goes on, becomes more and more of a like a desired good for a lot of low, lower income people, because for a lot of lower income people like they are mostly subject to the disciplinary like aspects of the state. So their right. lives getting far more policed uh, than, for example, like whites in the suburbs or higher income individuals. Um, and and you like, pair this I, with the work. Go ahead. And the way in, in one of the like rhetor rhetorical tools of like justifying this kind of like uh, uh, emptying the state of like all of its social welfare goods is by basically offloading the costs to the private family. Exactly. I mean, you see this even in the way we talk about like your family contributions to things is X and you see this all over uh, student aid, et cetera. Um, and by the way, those numbers are almost always misleading too. Uh, mm. And and I love it when you get scholarships that don't cover that the expected family contribution and also don't deal with the fact that most people can't afford them. Um, this leads me, though, to why I think we have to deal with a kind of dual problem here, because there is a reality that that we forget now that we've lived under neoliberal. Neoliberal concerns for so long, um, but that. If you look at the work of Gabe Weinart, or just like listen to me, frankly, I've been pointing out that the Fordist period and the neoliberal period are interesting and in where they're different and that difference defines so much. But they're also interesting in where they're alike because it explains why neoliberalism was easier to do mm -hmm. in certain places than others. Like, and it, it um, because what Fordism did effectively was use, while there were certain areas in which welfare was used explicitly and at government largesse and payroll, what it really sort of did was move the idea that a lot of the social goods are the, are, are come from two places. The corporation as part of the, the overall apparatus of daily life of which you would get your, your quote fringe benefits as part of your union benefits even. Um, and these would define more and more of, of how we did social welfare. So private insurance subsidized by your employer and partially subsidized through tax write offs by the government. Well, this is not actually a neoliberal policy it accelerates under neoliberalism it becomes more pernicious under neoliberalism. Yeah. Um, and attempts to fix it are tend to be neoliberal itself. That's like Obamacare's private mandate and all this stuff. Um, but it is in Fordism. And so this weird dynamic of the family, I when I started trying to figure out 
the last question, like when I would sit down and be like, why does a book describing the Fordist corporation and the media that comes out of that seem to apply superficially so much to now yet there's so many fundamental conditions that are different. And, and by that, I mean, you know, Lash's description of America as a culture of narcissism. Um, and he admits, for example, I think you and I have talked about this off air that like, he's not even talking about, uh, neoliberalism in fact when he writes about this in the 80s he doesn't think the book that that culture narcissism was about that mm -hmm. um so why does that seem to be accelerated and it's because on one hand we are making the family the union of dependency on a fundamental level uh and we accelerate that the neoliberalism that really begins during fordism and the right. promotion of the nuclear family, the promotion of suburbs, the promotion of that as a, as a means to reproduce a state life and that technology, as opposed to servants, would be able to reproduce the, the, the mother as a household and democratize that to, to the worker um, mm -hmm. and not just the landowner, the gentry and the bourgeoisie. Uh, and I think people missed that that was the whole project of the 50s, but that that is a Fordist project that sets up a lot of what you're able to do to the family in the 1980s. And that social destructiveness is interesting. And like, I remember, you know, we were yelling at that infamous uh, four hours of yelling. Um, for those who listen to this on audio, I didn't release that on audio because it was so long and so yelly. Because um, <laughs> it, it was like one of those why you father uh, moments for me when I was really going after a major influencer on my thought, Christopher Lash, uh, where he talks about how the family wage is insufficient, but it's so much better than it is now. But I'm like, but the family wage set all this up. Yeah. Right. That's something you need to keep in mind. The family wage and the, and the, and the father as breadwinner, um, as opposed to the family as a communal site of social reproduction, it's how you are able to really focus that in on the family during the neoliberal period in ways that bind people to their family, but only punitively. Yeah, this is, like, this is a big, yeah, this is a very important point uh, to kind of connect this to like the welfare aspect. Uh, a lot of social Democrats, like the kind of Jacobin people, they tend to kind of juxtapose the present day to like Neo, the, the, the New Deal, and uh, they like to say, well, look at all these welfare programs we used to have during the New Deal, during the, 40, the 40s to like, let's say, the 60s or 70s. And but I think they really actually mean the Great Society most of the time, honestly. Right. But go yes. ahead. But, but like the big point here and what they really miss is that they fundamentally ignore the continuities between uh, like the New Deal, to like neoliberalism. And one of the important things about America that differentiates it from Europe is that in Europe or the European social democracies, the state is the primary kind of distributor of like social goods, well, what one would call welfare and that sort of thing. But because of like the very unique, like kind of privatized structure of America, like during the New Deal, like a lot of our welfare, our welfare system basically became like a dual track system, where on the one hand, welfare is mostly distributed through property ownership, through incredibly generous benefits on owning a home, health insurance through your union, um, all these different benefits that very importantly were tied to working and were tied to the breadwinner father kind of ideal. But the second part of that dual, that dual welfare system is the much more ne uh, neglected part is the state-sponsored welfare. So think of, for example, uh, AFDC, what later became TANF, like the direct cash benefits that the state gives to the poor, which is associated not with the working father in the suburbs who has property, but is instead associated with the propertyless black single mother who, like in the 70s and 80s, was attached to like all these harmful negative stereotypes of like the welfare queen that was used to then uh, dismantle what 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 little. Uh, remained of like that second part of that dual track welfare system. And this is, this is a very important point that I bring up to a lot of leftists, which is that you cannot have this dichotomy in America between less welfare versus more welfare. 
you have to think about this in terms of like in America, most of our welfare is distributed through private channels as opposed to like public channels, as you would see in like, for example, the European social democracies. And, and this is an interesting, interesting point. It, it actually shows up in what I like to call the lack of imagination of the American socialist mind, which is a very long arc. I used to call it the crisis of the of the American socialist mind, uh, which, uh, if you know the famous book um, in Christian circles, the crisis of the evangelical mind, you will know what I'm referring to, um, mm -hmm. by Mark A. Knoll, and, and, and the first line of that that book, uh, which is a brilliant book, by the way, if you ever want to understand why evangelical Christianity in America is kind of what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And why it has to outsource all of its thinking to like reactionary Catholics? Is this, um, is this a book that comes from within, or is it like? An yeah, it comes from within, thing? but it, it it comes from a it comes from actually a Cal like a like a, a Jonathan Edwards theologian. Um, but it's a brilliant book. Um, but the, the the first line is the scandal of the evangelical mind is there is not one, and that's <laughs> that's sort of my scandal for the socialists, not because socialists are dumb and not because we don't have scholarship. In fact, we have too much of it. It's that we, we are so desperate to prove socialism as plausible by reaching into to the immediate American past that we actually don't know how to think about the immediate American past. And, and like, you see this in the, like, I detest FDR worship. Yeah, I'm one of the absolutely. few. It's awful. Yeah, like um, I want to throw Marx and Keynes by palmatic at people's heads whenever they bring up FDR, but that's just in the fiscal policy. I think the social policy of it, and I don't think it was intentional in FDR's part. I'm not saying FDR was a social reactionary because um, I don't think that actually. I also don't think he was particularly progressive. It was he was a developmentalist. Yeah, exactly. Um, it has a lot of the same problems and, and developmentalist socialist and quote communist countries unquote, uh, have a lot of similar kinds of conservatism, honestly. Um, but they didn't look at, like there's a, there's a fundamental ignoring that, you know, for example, the big debate over was the new deal racist, right? And the answer is yes. But don't believe everything the libertarians tell you about that. Yeah. Right. Um, and similarly, and instead of what you know, the normally Jacobin answer to the to the deceptive libertarian argument, it's just no, and that's really kind of not true. Um, and it really shows up in family policy, and it really shows up in the lumpenization of particular communities. All right. Now that lumpenization is much more general across the service sector working class um, and a lot of what we would might call the ex-industrial areas of the country. So yeah. the the gutted uh, cities of the upper Midwest, um, uh, the, the mid-sized urban areas that people forget about, which actually tend to have higher violence and crime than the big urban areas that people always cite. Uh, your Jackson, Mississippi's, your um, Macon, Georgia, where I'm from, where the murder rate was always higher than Atlanta, but no one ever talked about it. Um, and there's two ways in which this works. By tying it to the family into a generous property ownership, which all tied us into the social housing market, and it's wreaking havoc now as that housing market falls apart and frankly Europeanizes one of the things that you know you would always have Europeans come and I remember someone yelling at me about it many years ago um well Americans all have huge houses you grew up in a huge house and actually I didn't grow up in a huge house so I my, my mother was homeless for the first couple of years of my life right. um and and we grew up in a but she did own a home eventually because it was cheap until like 1985 relatively speaking even with high interest rates of like seven eight percent um, and what we have actually seen in America, and I know people don't want to talk about this, the, 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 despite the fact that we have higher interest rates because we have a fixed interest rate, um, and in Europe, they kind of have variable interest rates for homeownership in general. Um, uh, one of the major differences between 
between us and them is that uh, homeownership was not prioritized in the same way post-war. Um, and there are reasons for that in America, some which go all the way back to settler colonialism, but, but that's ended. That's ended really since the 1990s. But unlike Europe, we don't have any real social housing. I mean, even privatized social housing to really deal with it. So, right. so you know, that's why we're that's why the last twenty years have been defined by house too expensive, housing market crash. Although we, I don't think we'll see one coming up now. People don't think that as family policy, but it is. I mean, like yeah, like the way in which, like um, for example, post war. Uh, uh, a lot of like politicians rationalize home ownership was they did so in the guise or in the discourse of like traditional Jeffersonian kind of language of you know democratizing private like private property like this fundamental co contradiction of like democratizing or socializing a form of property that is fundamentally private. Like, yeah, I think what, what kind of we call this what kind the American of American yeoman brain, right? Like what characterized like uh, LBJ and like the early part of Nixon's presidencies was the attempt to extend the New Deal compact to, to black Americans because of their worry that like the family was so disintegrating uh, in the in those black communities that like they needed to like formulate a means of like reestablishing it and securing it. But as uh, I'm going to mispronounce her name. Uh, I hope she's not watching. But what Kayonga Taylor's book, Race for Profit, kind of shows is that um, that quest to uh, democratize housing amongst like the black community fell into the trap of the, the public-private partnership, which is at the fundamental core of neoliberalism. A lot of people think of it as like, oh, it's when the government and the private sector team up to help society. But what that generally means, especially in the real estate market back then, meant that like the real estate market didn't want to invest in black communities because they saw them as more risky for a variety of reasons so what the government right. did because of like because of uh vietnam war there wasn't much money and also much political will to like establish fully socialized housing what lbj nixon did was instead basically subsidize uh the real estate market into lending money to um in, to the black community in these like urban ghettos. What that basically meant was saying, you can have all the profit of like these incredibly risky like neighborhoods, but we're gonna eliminate all of the risk. So what they essentially did was uh, inaugurate a new form, not a new form, but like emphasize an, a, a, a latent, but then uh, increasingly explicit form of racism that Taylor calls uh, inclusive, uh, uh, predatory inclusion. Whereas during Jim Crow, blacks were excluded from markets. Uh, post great society, they are now included in markets, but were now preyed upon by these banks and these uh, real estate lend, uh, these mortgage lenders, to like take on these highly usurious terms uh, to acquire this dilapidated housing, which would accumulate like the problems of which would accumulate until the 2008 financial crisis, which destroyed black wealth and destroyed like what little home ownership that like blacks were able to acquire uh, because for a lot of these, especially like black women, black single mothers uh, who are on welfare because of the fact that like they had poor credit due to a variety of reasons that were like not their fault, um, they fell prey to these predatory institutions who were egged on by the federal government to try to democratize the de democratize private home ownership which destroyed or further uh like further exacerbated a lot of the problems that like the black community and especially especially black families had at that point yeah i think this is important to point out and this seems like a liberal talking point but it was that we have encouraged people to tie up their wealth in their homes uh 
mm-hmm. what little wealth was had was tied into these homes. It was at usury interest rates. And I, I used to work at an insurance company, and this is true for every insurance company. So if people look it up, I'm not slandering them. Um, redlining means that actuarial tables reflect badly on poor neighborhoods in general, but this also is highly racialized. Mm-hmm. So even if, and I, I remember the irony is I was sitting in an office working with people in the actuary department. I was in the accounts receivable department, um, going back and forth about some things. And I pointed out to two Morehouse graduates, real story, that that uh, they were actually highly discriminating against historically black neighborhoods yeah. without any explicit or I even think implicit racial bias. It's all structural racial bias. This is one of my push, pushbacks on uh, uh, Abraham X. Kennedy. I've never agreed with him on flattening out racism, you know, uh, just calling it all racism as if structural racism, implicit violence, uh, implicit bias and, um, and bigotry are all the same thing. Because right. he's like, well, we don't use that word for sexism. I'm like, well, we actually, we, we, we kind of do. It's a pretty kind of different types of sexism. Um, and we understand it there. We understand systemic uh, bracketing out of labor versus bigotry versus whatever. I mean, even Vox can explain that and why the wage gap is so pernicious and hard to deal with. Um, and when you disaggregate for different kinds of women, you get different results. Um, uh, you know, the biggest one being, you know, highly educated lesbians and and, and this is weirdly specific in tech and, uh, do pretty well actually, uh, on the dollar compared to their male counterparts, even though they are still slightly discriminated against. Whereas a field that you think is really progressive, such as academia, the uh, the gender disparity and wealth earnings is actually more severe. Um, and that's because academia's quote meritocracy has like no understanding of family and is totally based on an even pre-modern notion of like family responsibility, et cetera. Um, yeah, and, to, and to your point about the actuarial tables and like working for an insurance company, uh, people like Jackie Wong in her, in her book, uh, what's it called? Carceral Capitalism. Uh, as well as scholars like Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow, like a very important point they bring up in the, like during the seventies was um, a lot of black nationalists as well as a lot of Republicans thought that just instituting formal equality and destroying like uh, de jure segregation would ensure like, ensure like wealth would build up in the black community. But the problem is, is that by virtue of only instituting formal equality while not uh, addressing the severe wealth inequality between the black community and the white community, what they essentially did was just racialize credit scores where, for example, if, you know, Lehman Brothers didn't have to um, explicitly go after black people because they knew by virtue of like black people being poor, uh, low credit scores reflecting like a lot of like bad financial decisions, not of their choosing, of course, um, that if they just target low people with low credit scores, like they're necessarily going after disproportionately like black communities. Right. I mean, well, it's an interesting thing when we talk about racialization, because this, this is another element of family policy that I want to get in with you is even though I, I think this is a class first narrative that I think is true. Racialization was used to stop solidarity in the South in ways that benefited capital. I, where I agree with you and some liberal scholars against other class first people is I go, and it was rational for the people making that trade off, which Mm. I think horrifies people. But what I mean by that is like, if you're in a segregated society and you know that things really are racialized in a lump sum way. Protecting your privilege via racial animus is logical. Right. Um, and if housing laws, which is your only source of wealth, uh, are tied to credit scores in this way, 
And no one, and again, I don't think anyone set out initially to do this. This is the leftovers of a racist system running yeah. into, a, that is uncorrected, running into a modern actuarial system. Or, 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 um, because you would have high degrees of lumpenization. You'd have high degrees of, of lack of wealth. And yes, you would also have that in certain white communities. Um, but you had it in almost all black communities. So because even in the North, you had redlining and whatnot. And so that meant that these communities, you know, the houses really were more dangerous because they were, they were, you know, turned up and cut up in the kitchenettes, which were poorly set up and often didn't weren't to code. The, the, the crime really was higher because there's a lot of incentives for crime and that when you're when particularly young men are shut out of work um yeah. and conversely it made sense for the white for a lot of right racists to go well we have to, to get people on their side by saying look you have to protect your home value if one of these people come in even if it's even if it's quote race blind on paper they're going to drop your home value because they're going to yeah. be associated with all these negative factors. Now, democratizing that, this demo just democratized ownership, and by that we mean access to bank loans. It didn't fix any of those conditions. And, unfortunately, attempts to fix that, um, you know, the NIMBY-YIMBY debates both I, I, yimby is another is one of these things where i'm like yeah that's dumb uh but i get after years of nimby why you feel that way um and what i mean is like just letting people in your neighborhood isn't going to fix shit um is that if you ex if your neighborhood accepted section 8 housing ex like had a lot of black people come in you would have real value loss which incentivized you, even if you were not explicitly a bigot, to buy into a white supremacist framework. And that is on class and social reproduction lines. Similarly, if you understand this, and we're already talking about the problemization uh, of men and tying this to the family wage and tying it to a male breadwinner, and that was something that even socialists did. When you have a highly female-based workforce because men have been shut out of a lot of labor, particularly in the Southeast, forever, and in the North starting in deindustrialization, um, you're going to have a similar problem because not only you have, you're going to stigmatize welfare as being female and racialized, and you're going to not deal with the fact that you have already set this up where certain communities are going to be disadvantaged just from the way gender relations have worked. And to fix that, you're also going to encourage, and this is something we're dealing with now, kind of re what we would consider reactionary or defensive social conservatism amongst these families. Right. Um, and that is something that I think we see in a lot of the tensions um, around inter-democratic debates on like LBG versus immigrant stuff, et cetera. Well, yeah. one, of the, one of the interesting things that, um, have you read Fran uh, Francis Fox Pivens is regulating the poor? No, that one I have not read. Really, really great stuff. Uh, Pivens was actually a, a um, an activist during the 70s during the welfare rights movement. But a view that she shares with a lot of the Marxist feminists is the very interesting argument uh, that was laid at the feet of the federal government by a uh, welfare rights uh, movement, like activists and individuals, mostly women participating in, was framing welfare as not as a handout to like women and, and mothers, but as like, giving them what is already owed to them by virtue of like them being productive workers by productive we mean like by virtue of the fact that they produce like children who grow up into big strong workers for society as well as the fact that like through their unpaid labor like this is possible mm -hmm. not even speaking like a marxist way but like in a in a generalized way 
you see certain Catholic workers argue for this even. Like, yeah. Um, uh, that you have to compensate female labor uh, directly um, to incentivize. I mean, they want to incentivize birth rates and stuff that I, that I don't really care about. But right. Um, and, and by the way, when people say I don't care about birth rates, I, I I actually think in general we are not overpopulated, but we also don't have infinite resources. And by that, I mean. Yes, you have a capitalism problem, not a population problem, but it would be a lot easier to fix the capitalism problem with relatively lower worldwide population, um, assuming some other things. And those things are like, well, uh, the borders aren't artificially closed, et cetera, and so forth. Um, uh, I mean, I find the current situation in, in Europe and, and, uh, and the U.S. to be somewhat hilarious in that... You have the same people who have been fighting to shut borders down who are now complaining about uh, birth rates who also have policies that would disincentivize anyone having a child. So it's like it's a perfect storm of terrible policies from any standpoint um, because, OK, well, we don't have enough people. Uh, you, you want us to have more children and you're going to penalize us not having children. But also, you've done nothing to make it affordable to have children right. um, for anybody. And an interesting so, thing that you're finding in, like, for example, Hungary with uh, Orban was uh, I think it was like over CPAC because his whole thing is about uh, why a lot of kind of new right people mm -hmm. like him is the fact that he's he's closed the borders as well as created all these tax and financial incentives to have more children. Um, but <laughs> the the speech that that he gave it's the this year's CPAC uh, about that was so just, just fascist and so terrible that a longtime aide quit his team and literally said, this is, this is basically Hitler-esque. Like, this is reminiscent of, like, Hitler stuff. Because obviously, like, Orban isn't, like, extending these benefits to, like, migrants. Like, migrants from, like, North Africa, the Middle East. He's only extending these to, like, citizens, i.e., like, white Hungarians. Yeah, Which is I mean... What a lot of new right people want. Yeah, it does. I mean, this is what you, you see. What is it that, you know, I always think focusing on Richard Spencer is in some ways a distraction, but Richard Spencer basically wants Norway, but only for white people. Yeah, like, like this is the phrase that you, a lot of black Marxists use. A lot of, yeah, a lot of black Marxists use is uh, Heron Volk social democracy is what yeah. a lot of these people want. And this proposes a lot of problems for us as, as Marxists that I, that I think if you're going to deal with the class problems, you do have to deal with directly, mm -hmm. right? Like one of the things that I, 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 I have a very mixed opinion on Abraham X. Kendi. I hate his second book, how to be an anti-racist. I think it's kind of bad, but I actually love his first book because it, it shows you through, and he doesn't use social reproduction theory explicitly. At least I don't think so. But it shows you through social reproduction theory and understanding the way metaphorical thinking of late, of late medieval times ran into commercial capital and led to this whole racialization project, how race and class are not exactly the same, but they are totally interrelated in their modern formation. Right. Um, because the modern primitive accumulation trades are totally based off of it. Yeah. And he documents this pretty convincingly and extensively going back to the Portuguese getting into the Congo slave trade. Oh yeah. Um, have you um have you read Stephanie Kuntz's The Social Origins of Private Life? Yes. It's I love that book so much. It's probably my favorite book. Um I mean she's basically she's basically a crypto Marxist. Uh or at least she kind of uses a lot of like Marxist terminology and a lot of like his conception of like the his conception to like talk about the family and like throughout American history up to the thirties. But one of the most interesting points she brings up is how like it is impossible to democratize or standardize the nuclear family across all classes and all races, because as she shows in the early to mid 19th century and in the South in the early 20th century is that in order to have like a core of like nuclear people with nu like nuclear families, like the problem here is that like, 
household labor is so difficult to maintain on your own. Uh, this is something that a lot of nuclear families back in the 19th and 20th centuries ran into that you necessarily need a class of a class of people to come in and assist with like social reproduction in the form right. of domestic workers, which basically means like um, a, a large fragment. You need a large lumpenized class that is not really allowed to fully integrate into this. Yes. And now, and we don't have domestic, we don't have as many domestic workers anymore, at least in like the 19th and early 20th centuries. But what we do have now is the incredibly large service sector, like not just fast food, but healthcare, care work, all these different industries that through like piecemeal like functions basically like perform the same functions that were unified in like the one domestic worker who was carted into like the middle class white Anglo household to like assist with social reproduction. Right. And this needs to be understood. I mean, like, this is not unique to racial dynamics. This is the class stratification of England. And yes. you look at like England in the beginning of industrialization and in late 18th, early 19th century, you have like one fifth of women in the sex trade and one fifth of women into domestic ser into domestic service or something mm -hmm. like that. It's, it's an incredibly large um, portion of the population. It's like two thirds when you add when you add sex workers and domestic servants together. Um, mm. And um, it may even be higher than that. So like that's that, that's the last of it. And so you see this. And the, the the attempt in the 1950s was to use appliances to do this, but it obviously didn't work. Yeah. Right. Like, like the appliances were not as efficient, and the expectations of labor on the household actually increased due to them, so that you had the Betty for Dam problem for upper middle class white women, where yeah, I, you know I, that that isn't upper middle class white woman problem, but in the 1950s and 60s, but. You also have removed, you know, you've removed women fr fr from social life and removed social life from the home. Oh, yeah. So Ironic ironically, this is a point to a lot of the Marxist feminists who see the house as an extension of the factory. Because, like, when you see a lot of the advertisements in the 40s and 50s for, like, vacuum cleaners and ice boxes, um, the essential, like, language was this is a more, this will save you time to do other things that you like. Um, but what it actually did in practice was, um, like, that's how we sell automation in general. Yes, exactly. It just meant more work in the long run because you yeah, could do we, more things. This is this is actually one of my proofs of LVT against Keynesians and modern monetary theorists because they always predict that automation would lead to less. Uh, labor hours and in reality over and over and over again automation leads to more <laughs> labor hours oh, yeah. so um i, you I know. got yelled at over twitter because i was pointing out that like a lot of conservatives and especially even like social democrats like you know folks uh, who read jacobin um they got very angry at me because i point out that like yeah like the problem of the 50s for like a lot of women like white middle class women wasn't the fact that like oh, um, uh, we just need more money. It was the fact that like, oh, this labor that I'm performing in the household is like particularly alienating. And like, I'm deprived of like, I'm basically shunted out of the public sphere to like do all of like the work of social reproduction. Yeah, I mean, and this needs to be understood because this was not the case in the homestead actually, because mm -hmm. both partners took place in it. And the I idea, I mean- I always pointed this out like we I'm like, well, you always talk about wealthy medieval women because you think they don't work. And if you read like, I don't even know, Talmudic law, um, <laughs> like talks about like how both partners have to work and how a man should like marry someone who will work with him and certain because it's even though it's a completely different spirit and you want to talk about highly gendered labor, the Talmud is full of that. But my point is, it was understood even in the medieval period that women's work was an economic necessity and yeah. that it was actual work. All yeah. right. Um, the idea that it was just homemaking and even though home economics has a category, I know we've dropped home ec as a word, but it kind of betrays that they knew it um, was not private. Totally. 
because you had to have it for a society to function. Yeah. And it didn't function very well because you also see that this time period everyone was fucking dragging themselves to death. So it's it, it, it's something to look at, right? Well, conversely, you're also right. There, you have to have the service sector is not conducive to families. It is definitionally on hours that the quote-unquote traditional market, a.k.a. blue-collar labor and white-collar salary labor, is not working because you need them to be free to use it. Yes. So they can't be home. So having more, and we saw this in the 80s and 90s with the rise of latchkey kids. And I remember like yelling at Christopher Lash going like, you don't have an answer for this. You're, you see the problem and you're not wrong about the problem, but you don't actually have an answer for this because we're not going to be able to roll back to the family wage. And he admits that. So I see this also in, a, in you know, in a lot of people today where they're like, well, you know, this came up in my conversation with the class unity caucus and, and they said this offhandedly, like, well, the way you might convince yourself you don't want kids, but the reason why you don't want kids is they're too expensive. And I'm like, well, well, no, some people really don't want kids for one thing, yeah. but, but two, um, you're right, but you're not also looking at the fact that you can't just go back to the 1950s and how we reproduce this. This led us here in the first place and these problems some of these problems we're talking about are unique to america um and melinda cooper's research makes that clear but some of them aren't um and so i think that's that's interesting this is why i kind of i've always wanted a third way out of the family preservation a socialist versus the family abolitionist uh, because one family abolition, I think rightfully scares people because it is fa family is an area that you still have some unalienated social reproduction, although I, that's increasingly less and less. Yeah. Um, like when, you, when, when I hear when I heard so uh, family abolition for the first time when I was, when I was a conservative, I immediately thought, oh, you're going to take grandma away from me. <laughs> right. And <laughs> and I do think if you study the kibbutzim and stuff like some of the some like some of the schemas for family abolition do seem to me like, well, we've actually tried that and you're not looking at it. Right. Um, but when I go back to the 19th century and look at what they were talking about, I'm like, Oh, so you mean social reproduction is not totally tied to the domestic sphere uh, and thus being married um, that people should be free to marry whomever they want. Um, that, the penalty should to divorce should basically be how do you handle childhood rearing and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I, I look back at that and I go, Oh, that's a relatively modest task actually. Um, yeah. and like the problem here that like a lot of, uh, social democrats and conservatives is that like, um, in my circles, Catholics is that they, they say like, I want to put so much money into like, uh, you know, promoting the family and making sure people can have as many children as possible. And it's like, well, you're looking at this one sidedly because necessarily by virtue of funding one lifestyle, you are necessarily depriving another lifestyle of like, or another group of people living a, a different lifestyle of like a, a different, a different, for, like living as full citizens in society. I yeah. mean, we saw this, for example, in the fifties where, um, a lot of home, a lot of, uh, like bank lenders, you know, mortgage lenders, uh, only lent to men who had families and were married because they saw that as the ideal and like the most credit safe or credit worthy kind of individual. Whereas for single women or gay men, completely excluded from like home ownership, essentially, or like right. the, or like a like interest free or low interest rate mortgages for home ownership. It's interesting now that the way child rearing has become such a privatized cost and uh, that it is almost as cut in the other direction. I will totally admit that. Um, but, you know, as a person who has never had children, um, does not want children, um, takes care of other people's kids. So I don't need to for that psychological need. I mean, literally, it's my day job. Um, I... I have found that that like it took forever to argue, for example, to turn all of our 
birthdays into annual leave as opposed to family leave and sick leave and personal leave. Um, because I'm like, well, from the bottom line perspective, it doesn't matter. Why are you monitoring this? And why are you actually discriminating against certain groups? And that, and it was only fear of lawsuit uh, uh, off of gender discrimination uh, that led people to move away from, uh, you know, a lot of districts out here move, fi finally move from uh, family sick leave to just annual leave. Um, right. And... Okay, that's a small thing, but you see this throughout society, and particularly, I, I can give you reams and reams of it since I worked in insurance. Uh, um, when you're younger, being a single man really hurts you financially. When you're older, being a single woman really hurts you financially. Um, and that's just off of insurance rates. Um, and these are compounding feedback loops because, yes, the actuarial tables are based on real data, but the real data compounds the problem. And as we talked about with race, you can see this throughout the spectrum of family life. What I find about a lot of socialists is, frankly, they seem so removed from the real economy <laughs> in a lot of times yeah. that they're not talking about this at all um, because they're just talking about capital volume one shit, which is frankly not even that much of the actual economy of the developed world, even though I will still argue that it drives it. Most people now, because of the levels of automation, are only indirectly related to it. Right. Um, hey, so, um, yeah. I want to say um, I agree with all of that. And you were talking about children and like, uh, uh, I want to actually get to the, to, um, the, the PTA, the PTO moms and like the the, the war over schooling and, and that sort of thing, because I have an interesting book that I've been meaning to read that has a very interesting thesis. Uh, it's a book called Imperiled Innocence by N Nicola Beazel. Um, I, I saw have this, not read. So. I saw this in a book by Sven Beckert called The Money Metropolis, which is about the consolidation of the bourgeoisie in late 19th century New York, which is excellent, by the way. And she she essentially talks about Anthony Comstock's uh, Anthony Comstock being a progressive and social reformer of the late 19th century who led these very moralizing crusades over like protecting our children from pornography, um, like prostitution, all these different things. Um, and she she frames those moral crusades as like upper middle class and upper class parents worrying about social reproduction, i.e. like being able to pass on their status and their position within the social ladder to their to their children because they will succumb to or be tempted away by like these evils that will lead them cratering down to like cr cratering down the social ladder. And mm -hmm. I bring this up because I see a lot of connection with uh, that and our current our current situation where now more than ever, there's this perception of the family being attacked by like LGBTQ forces, pornography, and all these different situations. And I find it interesting because it seems to emanate, especially from a strata of American society that is at once fairly comfortable. So like middle class, like white families in the suburbs or not, not even suburbs anymore, but like the exurbs, but the like, exurbs, yeah. like precarious enough to where like they are worried about like their children's future and this worry being nurtured and cultivated by the Republican uh, media industrial complex, which runs off of money and basically feeding lies to our relatives 24 seven. Right. And so here's the thing I've always said, they're right to be worried. They're afraid of the wrong things. Right. No, 100% agree. It's like when I listen to how people get into Alex Jones world, for example, I'm like, I whipped you, I'm with you, and you're about to jump off of a, off of a diving board into the abyss, right? Like, it's <laughs> like your first two observations about elites running society and you being closed out are correct. Uh, the rest of the conclusions you're going to draw from that, that, like the Chinese and the, the gay frogs are somehow like, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, you know, similarly, um, and there's an interesting way in which people like Joss Hawley really are going to use this. There's a real fear that a lot of these parents have that maybe the reason why 
my children are coming out as genderqueer or whatever is that masculinity or femininity is on as on uh on appealing to them but the reason why is economic and i've actually heard josh harley say that right and i I'm, i find that fascinating because part of me goes well as a marxist i think there must be actual a core of of some truth to some of that right um you have no answer for it and the idea that you're going to make the economy better by fighting off the queers makes no sense although they're not he's also not being sincere either right well but even if he was like and i think that's the more pernicious thing and then you have the lives of tiktok stuff going on and and i always am amused but it always seems to be for example in utah they find like the two queer people in davis county and i know people don't know what that means but davis county is like the most conservative ex-urban uh our suburban county in the state um mm. you know it and utah valley are like you know God, utah. hand in hand yes yeah. jesus well I, here's the thing utah's bright web but it's not all conservative and i don't just mean like yeah. slc like there is a one of the interesting factors about bright red and blight brew states is it means that usually the in the most of the spectrums actually within one party Whereas in a purple state like Georgia, Florida, you basically have centrist versus fascists. Um, right. uh, and asterisk, yes, I know they're not really fascist. You, you know, it's kind of irrelevant, though, for what we're talking about here. I can go into the Adam Tuzian conditions about how, yes, I, I realize that all the conditions of the early 20th century are not replicated right now. And this does not really look like that. That but, too speak annoys me. I don't want to go into that because we're going to get sidetracked. Continue with your point. Right. Um, well, I think twos is both right and so what. Right? Like, it's just like. <laughs> like, it's, like yeah, oh, yeah. Like, it's not fascism. They're not World War I soldiers raised in a state of total war. If you talk to your average boat dealer in, like, North Augusta, Georgia, it only takes 30 seconds of talking to him to, like, make you, like, realize, like, oh, this guy thinks he's, like, literally besieged by, like, the forces – that are anti-civilization he's literally right. his mindset is in total war mode even if he's not a shell-shocked veteran who like fought in the psalm which actually is interesting and then actually i will relate it to this because this ties into social reproduction okay because in which case you have the mirror image of this but not the experience so these people feel like they're besieged and feel like total war but i have i, I have some some quote real fascist former friends uh uh because i used to be even more right wing than you used to be right and uh, <laughs> although i was never a fascist you you won't see uh, like oh, but Lord. i was pretty close i was pat buchananite so um i can tell you that a lot of those people also laugh at the claims of fascists because they're always like you think that fat ass is gonna come and rage total war like the fucking Viet Cong, like and that's from the right, you know, and I think it's interesting because in one sense, both things are true and we don't know what that means. Right. For people to have the imagination of total mobilization, but no experience of it at all. Um, yeah. So you have people who have a romanticized image, uh, most of them World War II. And they think, you know, they both are and are fighting against Nazis, which is, you know, an American thing. We've always kind of had spoke out of both ends of our mouth on that. Um, and in ways they are right in that their way of life is being besieged, but they they don't want to deal. I mean, like, this is the classic Daniel Bell problem, which Daniel Bell doesn't really actually answer, which is like, well, why do we support all this pro-capitalist shit? when we're also trying to promote pro family shit and they're at odds and you know, Melinda Cooper is the answer to how that actually works. But psychologically, it's still a pretty interesting question because it yeah. is also true that these people tend to be the petite bourgeois and lumpen shock troopers of a section of the Sunbelt elite. And they do whether rightly or wrongly really think that the queer flags are coming to get them in, in their way of life. And in some ways, 
their way of life is imperiled. Like there is a real sense, for example, I was talking about this in Utah. We have all these families who are like this, who are newly rich, almost all off land speculation and family land purchasing, honestly, Um, are off of getting really lucky with tech stock investment off of something once. Um, And a lot of them are, you know, they hate the quote PMC, but they are the PMC. Uh, They hate the elites, but they are them. Um, But there's also a real sense in which they kind of aren't wrong that their kids probably will not get most of what they have. Yeah. That it, it won't be there for them. They're wrong about why, but they're not wrong about that. And there, this is the one thing that I do kind of wish like socialists did speak to when we talked about social reproduction issues is that we need to speak to these problems. I don't really care if we're speaking about maintaining the family or removing it. Just like I always talk about, I always, when I talk about trans stuff and I push back on some people who talk about this as gender fads very, very softly, because I know what happens if you push hard, people start calling each other terse. It goes to shit. Yeah. Even if it's true, it's not productive. Um, it's a mutually reinforcing feedback loop. So I start talking about the importance for socialists to recognize bodily autonomy for multiple reasons. All right. Um, And I don't talk about bodily ownership because I don't actually believe in it. (laughs) I don't think we actually do own our bodies. I don't even think legally we really totally own our bodies, but, um, but I do talk about bodily autonomy for a variety of reasons. And then we can situate, trans issues and issues that affect more than trans people and i think that's important similarly with family abolition we need to situate this not in the abolition of the family because it is a having in a heartless world it's also a hell in a heartless world yeah like like um it and the irony, if you read that Lash book, is Lash even knows it. Lash knows the pressure this puts on the family unit is totally unsustainable. Yeah. Right? Um, um, that it, it, but we don't, we need to start selling a vision to people where, no, we want your kids to have all the same rights and stuff as you. And then, and then you could separate out the bigots from the non bigots because it's going to become a lot clearer then. Similarly, you have to engineer racial policies that separate out the bigots from the non-bigots because they become a lot crueler then. And I actually also tend to take the, the, the James Baldwin. If you disempower the bigot, but he still has the means to deal with his life, as long as he doesn't actively try to kill you, it's really not your problem. Right? Like, um, that's kind of the attitude I think we have to take here. Um, that said, I find the whole discussion right now to be so muddled and confused. About the trans thing or about uh, other no, things? No. All, well, see, the trans thing to me is is the reason why it comes up so much. And for my trans listeners, I, I don't mean to say the trans thing is it isn't important. Right. But it's a subset of gender social reproduction issues. Right? It's the most obvious and most radical one. It's one for which we have not historically had anything but a social fix. Now that we do have a biological fix for, um, it would be even more awesome if there is a way to go back and forth, but we don't have that yet. But there is now a way to fairly safely medically transition, particularly in adults. Right. And there's a, it, so the trans issue is a golden ticket for a lot of Republicans because there are enough trans people, I think, either I think 4 million, either 1 million to 4 million trans people. Um, there are enough of them to where like a lot of people have had contact with at least one, but like, but not, not so intimate like, contact. And by that, I don't mean sexual. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like not they don't know them. contact, but like not enough to where like, it would be a big problem if, you know, they start going after trans people. Right. It, it's, it, it is a 70% of the public tacitly supports their right to exist. You know, yeah, yeah. And I'm laughing because that's a morbid fact. It both seems high and also sadly pathetic at the same time. Um, but if you consider the fact that it really, it, 
if you're not in an urban area, um, it might not affect you. Yeah. You can demobilize about 30% of that. And so, then... yeah, like, like for me, like, I, I think like a few years back, I was always like, oh no, the Republicans, they're not going to, they're not actually going to go after like trans people like a lot. Cause like, you know, a lot of trans people, a lot of, they point out is that like Republicans are like going after them and, like really terrible ways in forms of state surveillance to the meme of like they're trying to make penis inspection day real at your local school um but then like once i started kind of talking to my few remaining republican friends about it uh and also seeing like the more egregious policies that have been coming out in the past year you know mostly just, out of florida mostly out of florida um i've kind of stopped hanging out with a lot of people because you know when i talk about these things especially coming out of florida and like even texas you know their most their response is like it's mostly shrugging their shoulders and i feel very bad because i say oh a lot of trans people were right they're they're coming after them the republican well, party i mean it was funny i think the only thing i ever there was almost a time where I, where I was silent on my show because someone said that uh, George Bush wouldn't put trans people in the caps the way Trump would. And I, the reason why I was silent was not that I disagreed that Trump would do it. Um, uh, because Not because I think Trump, Trump actually has particular animus towards trans people. I actually don't have a lot of evidence for that. I have an evidence that he doesn't give a shit. Yeah. Like, he, like um, it's the DeSantis... Many, probably doesn't care, like abortion, gay stuff. Right. Doesn't... Yeah. Right. It's just he doesn't I mean nuclear secrets, who knows? But um uh although even that I don't want to I don't want to do the propaganda on that either. Um we had DeSantis. DeSantis even if he doesn't care has has really really learned to make this into an issue. I've also seen it now used as war mobilization in Russia. Um and you know, I see this as a person who is not totally unsympathetic to to parts of the russian case against nato but i find that stuff to be wild um <laughs> uh and and it's it's explicit in a lot of the the, the ukraine stuff which i find also hilarious because it's not like ukraine was ever particularly good place to be a trans person it's um, so surreal seeing how like republican talking points like we kind of think the you know the republican right in America is kind of not isolated per se, but we just kind of think about it in terms of like America. But like a lot of these talking points germinate to like other segments of the global right. Uh, All right, in fact, a lot of them have origins in other segments of the global right. But right. What, what I was laughing at, or what I was shocked on, was like, no, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, even though his daughter was a lesbian, would have totally, oh yeah, put gay people in camps to get a vote. Like, yeah, do you, did we forget? All the the ballot initiatives they were encouraging in two thousand and four. Um, oh, yeah. I know you know you were very young, but I was twenty four. I remember it. Um, in fact, at that point, that was one of the many things where I was beginning to like really, really shy away from the quote dissident right because I thought they would stand up more for that because it's not not an issue we were supposed to care about. Um, and obviously, I was very wrong. <laughs> It's but, so cool seeing the, the the Putin give a speech and like other Russian officials talking about like the West, uh, like dominating Russia and them including talking points that uh, you know you'd hear and like literally hear on Tucker Carlson as though Tucker Car Tucker Carlson has a a two way re um, like telephone with the Kremlin. It's so surreal. But so I'm going to be a materialist for a second though and. I think that's because we leftists need to start really thinking about the social force is driving all this right. and how it is global. Yeah. Because capitalism is global. And this crisis of the family that we were hinting at in the beginning, um, gender fluidity, uh, particularly if it can be truly biologically fluid, if we can spend our lives as different genders, depending on what part of our life we want to spend it. Now, like I said, that does not exist yet. It, it may not be possible. I don't know. But that is a big fear for people. And I find that fascinating that that's a big fear for people. Um, 
because it speaks to the fact there's so much caught up into this idea of social reproduction, meaning that we have to take it seriously and not think it's something we can just throw money at. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also means that we're going to have to really think about how to frame this in ways that are inclusive and not altruistic. And, and what I mean by that is if we are basing protecting trans rights off of altruism, trans people are fucked. Yeah. Like, um, if we are basing, like, and, and I will say gay rights learn this, and while it had a de-radicalizing edge, and we're even seeing this in the way certain gay men have turned tail on trans issues, and certain uh, more well-off lesbians have too, although I, I think at a much lower point proportion of yeah the, the lesbian the lesbian turf stuff is more of a thing in like the united kingdom right yeah. um and and i also think europe may actually be one of the few times where europe is more backwards than us on something but um uh i i think you have to frame this as a bodily autonomy issue yeah. in a very real way and not buy into the the entire debate here about you know how tra you know sexual deviance for, uh grooming etc i can tell you for example uh this whole group calling everyone a groomer trend makes me mad and it makes me mad for a couple reasons one most teachers aren't groomers two most lbgt people aren't groomers statistically speaking it's really low um it's not none though so you can find real examples um but uh, it also makes dealing with the actual instances really hard. Mm -hmm. Like grooming is a problem in schools. It's just not from. It's actually mostly young men who often don't even realize they're doing it. All right. Yeah. Um, and I don't say that to excuse them because you know if people want to know how I would handle uh, impropriety amongst teachers, it, it's actually probably far more severe than I think most people would want. Um, uh, you know, my inner Stalinist comes out on this issue and I'm, you know, I become like, put them in camps and disembowel all of them and, you know, make them do work as they bleed out. Labor in the countryside <laughs> will, uh, will purify them. Right. Uh, yeah. Labor in the countryside with, uh, no bowels. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, so don't put me in charge is the larger, you know, portion of this uh, of this of this argument but in a very real sense it makes it hard to deal with this um because it politicizes something and it was like with crt the moment the right figured out how to politicize crt one i knew we we're never going to have an honest conversation about it again it's benefits our problems because we yeah. kind of can't um two um, it will become a buzzword for things that have nothing to do with CRT, both moderate, like just teaching that slavery was a problem, uh, to super extreme racial ideologies. Um, no, to, to your point about the autonomy thing that you mentioned about making this an autonomy issue, like you see the right uh, do this uh, when talking about the trans stuff, because the way a lot of them frame this uh, and like the most the, the way mo the average person would find this most sympathetic is uh, in the way they frame this is basically saying like these trans people are coming for your children and they're indoctrinating them into thinking that they want all want to take all of these chemicals and these hormone uh, therapies so that they could you know become trans uh, which implicit in that argument is the, is the notion that like uh, these trans people this other is violating the the relationship with the ownership that you have over your child's safety. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't make this explicit, but like it is an autonomy issue, even for the right. Right. That's, that's how they're able to, that's, that is the cell. Right. And that's, that's why they changed the logic from like the homosexual agenda to liberal groomers and yeah. playing with the ambiguity when they use those terms, like, you know, they'll backtrack and say, Oh, we only mean you're grooming them to be liberal. But then, you know, you, oh, why don't you use indoctrinate you like you used to? You know what you're doing. Right. Um, and, it, and it touches on the um, the relate the very uh, what a lot of people, a lot of people is the sacred relationship between a parent and a child, which Marx talks about in the manifesto is basically like a lot of people think a lot of people think that they own their children. And like 
a trans a perceived trans person and uh coming in and like indoctrinating your child in a school um which touches on the issue of like for a lot of these white parents and like these ex exurban kind of suburbs like they don't see their children half the day for half the day they're in, an, in they are in a stranger's care so like the trans thing it's not only an autonomy issue but it's also like a violation of like a traditional understanding of like the parents like ownership of their child not just their child but also their their welfare what what happened i mean covid showed that the, the the weird schizophrenia on this because you have people who are traditionally trying to take apart the public school all of a sudden demand it was open and defended hmm. um and care about stuff that they have not traditionally cared about like a uh, general child welfare and psychology um and liberals largely took the bait on that actually um and uh i'm not going to go into this because I, I don't touch covid related issues on youtube because it's a good way to get your video just removed but um uh there is a sense in which one of the habits of the american left which goes back to american liberals is we have we tend to take a framing from academia wait to defend that framing when it's attacked from the right um <laughs> Uh, and then defend it really poorly, letting the right set the terms on what it is and what we respond to. All right. And instead of reframing this stuff, which might have a useful, you know, I'm not here to tell any subgroup, a woman, cis or trans, a man, cis or trans, how they should frame the way they talk to themselves and in communities where they are accepted but we do have to deal with with the, the fact that they aren't accepted in all the political communities and we have to change that and the way to change that is to let people feel included and this is also just in generally true about family issues mm. all right we do not want to make parents feel like they are at war with the state but we also do not want our 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 society also i mean because this is this to frame it just in terms of states actually misleading um that's why the culture war is also really interesting for the right because they can their anti-state state can be a proactive state but on weird and arbitrary things um yeah. uh and one that it becomes a state of except i hate using smitty and logic but this is true here it becomes a state of exception for like we believe in civil liberties because we're good conservative liberals, except on this, this, and this. Except when um, we want to make penis inspection day real. Right. And, and you know, this, that, and the other. Um, and I think that is a recipe for social war. All right. Um, and I use social war, not civil war, for, for, for reasons. Civil war is a political act in the way we commonly define it. Social war is not. Um, social war is parapolitical or quasi-political or whatever, but it, it's not only in that realm. Um, and its answers are complicated. Um, yeah. And and may easily turn violent, honestly. Um, yeah. And in fact, you know, when people predict civil war in the United States, when you really pin them down, this is what they're actually saying. They're not actually saying that they think there's going to be an army of Trumpists versus an army of Democrats, because we all know the moment that happens, like the general chiefs of staff just take over and bomb a few leaders and we all shut the fuck up. Uh, and people are like, you really think that? Yes, I do really think that because we have the most our, our, our military deals with much harder people than with us. Yeah, um, no experience it, with like guerrilla warfare, hiding in mountains. Like yeah. this would not be very hard for them, right? It, you know, it's it's uh, it would totally disintegrate society and social trust, and there'd probably be split off states and stuff like. But in the main, um, but that's not what they actually mean. What they actually mean is the stuff like we saw with Nancy Pelosi's house being raided. And look, I also hate Nancy Pelosi, but this stuff is dangerous, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, um, what people mean is like low grade political violence that like and, and quasi political violence because that's also 
how both sides can kind of deny it's happening. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. She's upon like a term you, you mentioned, the culture war. Um, Robert Self, in his great book, All in the Family, um, it's not my favorite book by him. American Babylon's my favorite, but doesn't matter. He, he has this great point about the, talking about the Republicans emphasizing culture issue, cultural issues versus uh, economic issues or the, the general de demarcation being like social issues versus like economic issues. And the point that he brings up is that this, this is kind of a false dichotomy because like the culture and the economic are very much intertwined. And you see this, for example, with the trans issues, because like a lot of people, you know, rightfully like so think it's like not connected to the economy or like social conditions. But like what a lot of people are actually worried about here is that like the proliferation of trans rights will, uh, number one, subvert the relationship a parent, ha not relationship, but like the almost the ownership that a parent has over their child. Uh, number two, subvert a lot of like um, touch on the fear of like not having control over your child and also like a child changing her body, changing their body such that like their life or like they will no longer be able to fit within the social relations of like a given community i.e let's take for example i don't know marietta georgia or like uh greenville south carolina like generally like red town red exurb um that like a trans person in within that place would be to a lot of parents minds weird or not good and a lot of bad host of bad reasons um, Although it's interesting because, uh, okay, this is going to be slightly controversial. Anecdotally speaking, you encounter trans teenagers more in better off excerpts than you do in uh, um, poor parts of town, um, particularly. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, which is not to say there's none. And it's yeah. also not to portray like poor people are reactionary because I also don't think that's true. Um you know, it's. I think sometimes people are even surprised how much social acceptance there is for trans people amongst, say, like, elderly working class women um, who just really could give a shit, right? Yeah. Like, it's really not on their horizon. Um, but, but if you're one of these, and I think that this is what's interesting about this, because this is an issue that encapsulates what we're talking about in the family um, and why it's important to deal with economically, but also, you know, and we're two cis dudes talking about, it. I mean, I, I realize the irony of this, <laughs> um, but it you also know, but is guys who come from like fragmented family, like atypical families. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I came from a fragmented family and I've seen the violence of both having being stuck in a family and not having one. And right. so, like, that dichotomy is very much in my mind. Um, I also, because I'm a leftist who's been working in the arts for 15 years, even though I mostly now work as a high school teacher, have lots of trans friends um, and have also been, frankly, on the wrong side of this issue. Um, I do think, however we do have to change the framing on this. And this is going to be true for these family issues as a whole, because the way the left is choosing the fight, the culture war now is to seed it and, and to also just give it up and say, okay, we're just going to fight the class war. Yeah. That's this bad. is the way all this stuff is tied into the class war. Yeah. Like this is a big issue found with the, uh, the George Floyd uh, uprisings in uh, 2020, where you had a lot of, uh, a lot of leftists specifically kind of Jacobin leftists, Writing about how like the the uprisings or like uh, uh, the 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 protests in the streets were uh, distractions from the the real class issues, like completely papering over the fact that like a lot of these protests and uprisings were in fact over the the incredibly uneven and discriminatory way in which like public services were remitted to like black communities. Right. I mean, it's also interesting because. I, I found that tack to be completely weird and opportunistic and tailist um, because it was like, you know, during the Georgia, you could say what you want about BLM now. And there are real critiques to be made, including that 
like there have been real grifts made out of BLM and you've had almost instant recuperation and almost instantly capture this time. I mean, people kind of pretend like this all began with the George Floyd's uprisings and not the Ferguson riots, um, you know, and that there wasn't eight or nine years building up to this. We have, we, one of the things I hate about leftists, they tend to think in eventual politics. So they wipe out processes, <laughs> um, uh, that you see this in the way they talk about 1917 to the way they talk about the George Floyd uprising. But it was also interesting to me because one of the things people, one of the things that certain black bourgeoisie did use um, to, to disempower more radical elements within their own ranks was that there were a lot of radical white people who saw their interest in this. Now you can talk about the lack of sincerity in maybe places like Portland. I think we can't know, right? Like, I, I, I will shit on Portland all day, but on this, I said, we, I don't know. I was not on the ground there. But I can say in Salt Lake, people actually started seeing their interest in this for more than just altruistic reasons. Because the cops don't just mess with black people. And and people know that. Like, mm-hmm. But they're begin- there is a sense in which, and amongst a lot of, a, a lot of younger millennials and older zo- uh, Zoomers... And which the the point that like whatever happens to the black community will eventually happen to most of us on the bottom was really coming through. Right. So you had this. This is one of the most. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. But the Jacobin answer kind of fucks both narratives. Like, no, yeah. This is an important point that like um, I forgot whose definition this was, but like fascism being like colonialism coming back to the imperial core. Uh, if you pair that with the domestic colony thesis, you basically see that with police militarization. Like the police is at first militarized in like these poor black communities in which like the members don't have control over their like their surroundings, their like businesses, social relations, etc. cetera. Uh, and then that militarization slowly spreads out to other police precincts and like units that like mostly patrol, like not upper class white suburbs, but like like poor whites. Poor white Poor suburbs, white suburbs like, middle even middle class yeah, white suburbs. Yeah, like, like in my town in Green, Greenwood, Greenwood, South Carolina. You know, it's a kind of poor former uh, mill town in upstate South Carolina that's like kind of kind of lives a half life. You know, kind of gentrifying, but but not really. Like yeah, similar people, to Macon, Georgia. Like, yeah, like the people who drive the nicest cars, they're not the people who live in the like the gated wealthy community where all the professionals of Greenwood live. It's the police officers with like their police cars with like 2022 model like cars that are just like decked out. Um, and it, it, in this like generally like pretty diverse community. Right. Well, I mean, that's the other thing is if you go down the class ladder, segregation in either direction gets harder and harder to do. Um, uh, it. it <sighs> I know that sounds weird. That's not always historically true, but like, um, you know, poor black people can't keep white people out of their communities. Upper middle class black people kind of can if they want to. Uh, mm-hmm. They usually don't. But um, and conversely, also, if you're a poor white person, you have to deal with people of color unless you're in like Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, which I pick specifically because, you know, are like the Pacific Northwest, right? Um, because you're just not going to be in an area where you can be isolated from, from right. people of color. And and I think this is what one of the things that leftists need to be better at. Because, and I don't just to say that because, oh, working class people are never racist. They sure as fuck are, actually. Like, everybody has a section of their population that is racist. Right? Oh, yeah. Um, um, I think it actually gets worse the more up the class ladder you go until you get real high. But uh, in general, um, it's everywhere. Um, I also don't think racism in terms of bigotry is only a white problem. Um, and that's reinforcement, which is another reason why I disagree with Abraham S. Kendi on collapsing everything down into one term racism. And it's also because... it's also a problem because of our classification of the new right of at least fascist elements, because it's not a completely white phenomenon. 
No, That's it's absolutely not. And I think even just saying it's anti-blackness actually misses the point, which is the way it's kind of framed academically. I'm like, no, there are racial tensions in multiple directions amongst multiple groups, and and they are particularly in petite bourgeois parts of the economy. Like, if you're going to do... Inter I, I guess I am yelling at liberals here. If you're going to do intersectional analysis, actually do intersectional analysis. Well, this is the most important thing about, like, understanding race is that, like, the thing that separates a lot of liberals and everybody to the right of liberals versus, like... Uh, radicals and like less mechanical Marxists is that the latter group understand that race is not a fixed category in space, but is something that is constantly constituted and reconstituted between like the re reproduction of the relations between different groups. Right. Well, yeah. For example, the first time I ever heard white Latino used in the news, which was during the, uh, uh, the George Simmons shooting of Trayvon Martin. Um, which was actually a watershed moment, all right, mm. for a lot of reasons. Not just because the Trayvon Martin killing, those things happened all the time. Not just because it was a, not just because it was a travesty of justice, of which actually I will even take the slightly unpopular saying and saying that the prosecutors overcharged in a way that almost ensured that it would be. Um, the, the, the point that that I would say here is that it showed you that the premier like the the barriers that have been recently actually erected around latin people started to be broken down amongst different lines which clearly had already been the case for 30 40 years but now could be spoken about in public like wasn't and george what, zimmerman not hispanic yeah he was white he was white latino so he was he was um I think it was half something. And I don't love when liberals, uh, like, for example, in a lot of the school shootings, there was this rash of, like, half Asian, half white dudes for a while who were uh, spree killers, like, mm. you know, mass shooters. Um, I'm particularly tied into the incel movement. And you would hear them referred to as white. And I found it very interesting because I was like, well... For the racist, that has no purchase over because they're going to see them as mixed anyway. Yeah. And um, it actually is distorting some of what is happening in these communities. And one of the things that I, I will say, and, and maybe this is an unpopular opinion among socialists, all right? I don't believe in the right to sex. I don't believe in the right to someone else's body. God, I, hope, um, I hope that's not controversial. No, that's not the controversial part. Oh, okay, um, good. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, uh, <laughs> the controversial part, though, is I do think incelism is another side effect of this inability to deal with social reproduction and also our inability to frame it in ways that make it look good for men. Um, and ironically, it was the liberal feminist writer Hannah... Um, Rosen, uh, who in her end of men book, a terrible, an outdated book, terrible, made some interesting observations about the rise of women in service work because of the particular way the 2008 financial crisis hit, which actually makes more of our point how you cannot disentangle this um, entirely. Uh, I would go so far as to say one of the interesting, another interesting thing she points out in that book is the socialization of people to date, to date within their social class being stronger amongst women than men for reasons that have to do with social reproduction, which I think has lessened dramatically in the, in the subsequent 12 or 13 years, actually. Um, I say this as a person who, when I used to make less money than my wife, I would freak out like, uh, and I'm not even like a straight dude. So right. uh, it was ingrained in you in some way. Right. Um, it is breaking down, and I actually think that's a good thing. Um, uh, but um, uh, we frame this as incel losers versus kind of like those of us who are aware and feminist and good, and not as, say, uh, what women have better sex under socialism, and thus also men probably will too, right? Um, right. Uh, because 
if people are free to choose you on the conditions of, you know, um, I mean, you think about the complaints of incels, it's like, well, you guys, you don't have a lot of ambition because you don't see a lot of future in the workplace. So you give in the video games. So you don't have a, so you don't have a means for self improvement. Blah 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 blah. And I think a lot of that's actually true. By the way, yeah. like it's a, those are real conditions. Um, and, and to your point, I should say, um, uh, and I because I like that point you said about the uh, women have better sex and their socialism. This also applies to men. And to kind of expand upon that point, like it's a two way street because as like feminists point out, like under class society, women are are like objects to be possessed. Mm-hmm. Like they are things to be possessed. And so within women, there's this like in the mind, it's not just women existing or themselves existing, but also like a third eye that is constantly looking upon them to like make sure that they are existing in a way that is desirable to men and to society. But there's also a two way street here where like as much as there is pressure to be like a good object to be possessed, there is also a pressure to be like a possessor of that object. Um, right. And be good at it and, and keep it around. At it. Yes. And like, I feel like with the, inc- like with a lot of incels and I want to be clear here, I'm not saying that like incels are as oppressed as women. That's- oh, fuck no. That's not what, yeah, but, no, but I no. do, I do want to say that like, you can say that women in these situations have a much worse situation than men and also say, well, it sucks to be an incel and a lot of it actually is right. tied to class shit and we should talk yeah. about that class shit um, in a way. Because, mm-hmm. because a lot of these people are like their parents are like downwardly mobile. Like people are like vaguely like kind of precarious members of like the middle class, upper middle class strata. And like by virtue of feeling like you cannot fit into that ideal role of a man as like a possessor of women, i.e. a possessor of the possessed, like one way of responding is by lashing out and by blaming women because you cannot possess them as opposed to blaming the social relations that like dictate that like there has to be a possessor and a possessed in the first place. Right. Because trust me, people will love you more if the stakes are not you are owned or not. Right. Right. This ties in a lot with the masculinity stuff. Right. And and this is this is what I have actually talked about this. And I, I I do get pushbacks on this from socialists where I'm talking about where I say like we really should model what not just that we we allow for gender fluidity, not just that we encourage people to express non stereotypical traits. We should also model what it means to be a non toxic man. Mm in this scenario right all right um i'm not one of these people who pushes to drop the term toxic masculinity because i actually think that adjective actually does imply that it is not all masculinity (laughs) like that's why there's a fucking adjective um but uh i would i would say that we don't talk about you know we we actually leave this almost solely to conservative spaces and that's Um, bad Right, and I, and I don't say that we should only be talking to lost boys because, look, <laughs> as the evangelical churches have been trying to do that under Jordan Peterson syndrome, they're losing women, which has been the only group they have actually historically kept for a long time. So right. they're not gaining men from it. But my point is is that we do have to think about this this social reproduction issue and these issues of the family in terms of, like, what does it mean to be pro-social socialist? And not just in the woke, scold, shamey way. Yeah. Like, not, what's the positive model here? Right. And it's not just important for, like, us to understand this by virtue of, like, uh, being invested in the advancement of socialist and communist theory. But it's also important because to the average person who, like, exists in the average world and has, like, an average understanding of politics, to them, like, the only people talking about the, quote, unquote, you know, crisis of masculinity are conservatives, now, for a lot of socialists, like, they don't believe in masculinity. They think it's bad to talk about it. You know, not touching on that. I get I get the reasons for why a lot of socialists are skeptical of this. I myself share a lot of these skepticisms. But it nevertheless is important to, at the very least, not cede this issue to the right 
because for a lot of people existing in average American society, this is this is an important thing to them. Right. Well, I mean, gender fluidity would imply that some people would stay in their birth gender and that that would not necessarily be a huge problem. Um, and like I said, I like. I, I have always been one of the people who, like, I would love to live in the Ursula K. Le Guin world of the left hand of darkness, where I can, where, you know, if I could experience the world as a woman for a couple years and then go back, man, I'd kill to do that, but I want to come back. <laughs> um, and maybe I wouldn't want to come back, but I, I don't want to take the risk unless I know I can. You know, right. it, like, this seems tangential. But that also means we have to have a way to talk about these people. Because I also will say, you know, I'm, I'm going to say something controversial that may piss a lot of leftists off. Oh um, um, Right-wing men, for as toxic as their culture is, and it absolutely is toxic, um, and the man of spear is fucking awful, there is, however, a part of right-wing culture that teaches a fucked up but pro-social vision for how men should relate to women in ways that are not violent and are not manosphere. We yeah. do not have an equivalent of that. It does yeah. not exist um, for us. And, and, and actually, I would say it allows a lot of socialist bros, because people get mad at me when I talk about the bro problem, <laughs> but it allows a lot of socialist bros to be kind of shitty people yeah, because really? uh, uh, because they are hiding behind a lack of a pro-social model um, and usually something else like abusing class first analysis to totally class reductive analysis. Um, right. Uh, you know, uh, you, you always know my fun thing is I always like to say class reductivist or I'm never class reductivist enough. Um, and by that, I mean, they don't, if you go deep enough on the origins of class, you actually come out the other end being like, it actually is fucking complicated, man. Um, like Cedric Robinson, black Marxism. We're going to fight over that book. Um, let's not, let's not open that can of worms. Um, um but, uh, but, yeah. Anyways, I, what, what were you saying? Well, I do think you have to deal with, um, you have to deal with the fact that the weird thing about right now, as far as the way the socialist discourse is going, okay, a lot of the a lot of what the class reductivists say is actually correct about what they're saying and about, but incorrect when you apply it as a general rule, and they are generally applying it as a general rule. Right. Um, like the idea that if we if we were to just race neutralify everything, or gender neutralify everything, or just class, that most of these problems would be fixed. I we we've actually seen that that's not true. We know that it's not true. We've yeah. tried it and it failed. Um, An important point that Lenin kind of uh, this was in Lisa Vogel's book towards a, a unitary theory of Marxism, mm -hmm. um, kind of like one of the the foundational texts of the seventies, kind of doing the synthesis between Marxism and feminism. Uh, there's this really funny passage she brings up where Lenin talks about exactly like um, these socialist bros, as you have it, where he talks about like, you know, these, you know, these, these communists, these members of the party talk this big game about, you know, being uh, working for the emancipation of women. But when we have our meetings, uh, whether in ha people's households or uh, in like ha union halls or whatever, um, they're never the ones in the kitchen, like helping the women like wash dishes. Right. It's interesting, actually. I think that's weirdly self-aware of Lenin because when you read all this stuff, we go back and read this. So, but Lenin himself was not particularly great on these issues. He's not. Uh, in that one passage, and by the way, this is way later in his in his life. But but he's aware of it. It's interesting that like he he gets the dynamic, and he kind of predicts a lot of the problems you're going to see. And like Woman's Day in the Soviet Union during like the end of High Stalinism and in the Khrushchev period, because it, you start recapitulating a lot of the bourgeois gender relationships in ways that yes. are kind because, of messed uh, up. Because crucially, because uh, they talk a lot, because a lot of the communists, you know, were for like abolishing the family, like Clara Zetkin writes about it. 
um, kind of like these shared communal kind of a, one could say apartment blocks where like laundry yeah, they, was shared, all these different activities were shared. But the problem with like in the Soviet model for like a variety of logistical reasons, as well as other reasons, is that like um, a lot of women still lived in private dwellings, but they still have the like they have these kind of communal facilities to do laundry in. But like it's still continued the double day that women suffered under because not only do they have to like do a shift at these like laundry places and these communal eating halls but they also have to go home to their apartments to do the same for their families right and and uh kind of funnily enough rep replicates the problem of working women and capitalism and one of the things that i do think lash wasn't totally wrong about where you have the fact that women have been quote emancipated leads to them doing double work. Um, yep. you know, Mazaros uh, talk, yeah. talks about this in the Soviet union. They may have uh, overthrew the bourgeoisie, but they're still ruled by capital. Same with the United right. States. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's one of these issues. And, and as a person who worked, uh, as a caregiver and worker, because I had a spouse who had cancer, um, for, for many years, uh, it fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. um, it made me real aware of what I'd asked women to do at earlier points of my life. Because <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. like, oh, no, I got I worked, you know, we both worked. You know, we actually both worked as teachers. And then we come home and she literally didn't have, she did not have the physical capacity to do the work anymore. So I did it. And, um, and we'd had a fairly equitable, you know, as far as it goes. Uh, before them, but man, did that blow? Oh yeah. Um, to, and, to lesser, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. It's just it was like it was a it was an eye open. It was an eye opening thing for me because a lot of people's divorces make them more and more reactionary. Like I, I can almost tell. Like okay, someone got divorced. They're gonna flip sides now. Like, um, you laugh because you're young but you can start telling who's going to betray <laughs> by when they get divorced um I, i'm not going to list out because i don't publicly shame people but there's plenty of course um uh however for me because of the particular nature of of my marriage and trying to stay through and be a caregiver it like blew my fucking mind on social reproduction stuff and uh i've had arguments with other socialists in fact I've had arguments with other socialists and this was a reason why I quit working with them over me arguing that a lot of this gender stuff is not outside of the spectrum of socialism and it is not outside of the spectrum of class relations. And while Marx and Engels may have seemed conservative on it by our standards in some ways today, true. And like Engels said some pretty horrible shit, but he also like, I say that not to undermine Ingalls because Ingalls also wrote like the book, even though it's based off some of bad anthropology, there's some fundamental truths in his, in his work on the family that did turn out to be true about private property, changing the nature of the relationship between men and women. And that being tied to agriculture. Um, and that being, you know, the, the kind of beginning of class society. Oh, yeah, like, like an important point uh, to your point about your mind being blown about social reproduction, and this is to a much lesser extent because what you went through was much more, which was much heavier. But after like going through my phase of doing a lot of research on like Marxist feminists, not Mar Marxist feminism, reading a lot of Federici, a lot of Vogel, a lot of those people, I just started kind of like opening my eyes and seeing like you know hanging out with friends and having dinners and just sitting around outside and then like when one of my woman friends stands up they just automatically just take everybody's plates that are empty and just take them to the kitchen i was like oh wow oh oh they just do that like it kind of opened my eyes to like how how from a very early age so many women like the vast majority of women are socialized to be like to do those things and to for a man like me, like this is invisible because I was not socialized to do these things. Right. However, which I I'm not having it because this is I'm going to add to it. Yeah. Do them, particularly do them as a as a way of living, like be a male nurse, 
are um which is you know not a field that doesn't have a lot of men in it actually because sometimes you do need brawn um be a uh be a male elementary school teacher not a high school teacher an elementary school teacher and see how you are treated all right really um because you are also implicitly breaking a socialization pack by doing it it's subtle it's soft you still have a lot of male privilege but there's it's a lot of people wonder what is wrong with you yeah right? yeah i see that now I live in Utah, which 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 uh, has gender relations about five to ten years behind the rest of the country. Um, you can see this in our birth rates, but um, uh, I, I say that because it, it, I I literally will sit in meetings where, um, look, you don't want me taking notes in a meeting, but I I started getting weirded out by the fact it was always women who did it. Yeah. Always, always. Um, and, you know, since I work in a mostly female field with it often tends to have male leadership, whole different problem. Um, I see a lot of this like more explicitly, but you just see this all the time. Um, and even I'm like, I work in an English department, uh, high school teachers, it's all men. All right. And that's so incredibly rare that even I'm like, what is wrong with us? <laughs> like like it like goes it, like there's a part of your head that just like that it's still there right like you can't it, it, and i guess this is where the yes all men does kind of come in you can't totally divorce yourself from it so the only way to first deal with it is to make it conscious all right conscious is raising it's full, uh, largely full of shit but this is kind of true um but then also to figure out, well, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to model it? What are we going to say we should do for the family? Because, like I said, I believe in a lot of the things that we would file under family abolition. I don't want to call it family abolition anymore. Not, And I don't think it's just because of branding. I also think, like, we do have to deal with the kind of contradictory nature of which family for most people is both their safe place and their health. Right. Yeah. And, and why that is the case and how to deal with that um, and how to deal with blood relations, because I don't think socialism automatically gets rid of them, um, no. uh, is something that socialists really do need to take more seriously. And I, I have come over to the fact that while I do think Marxist feminism is a slightly redundant um, uh, as a phraseology, we need it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do think it would look different. I think a truly Marxist feminism, just like Marxist racial politics, does look different eventually from liberal politics. But the way it should look different is not denying like sociological truths that liberals see. Right. right? This is a this is a, a big problem with like the family abolition stuff, which you know, the preface there like the vast majority of the sentiments in, that entail it, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to, especially as a foster youth who like, I was never raised under a traditional family kind of form. So I'm very, I'm very sympathetic to a lot of those aspects. But the problem here is that like, family abolition is not actually saying like, we're going to abolish the family, i.e. like, there's going to be no more families. What it instead say, what it, what it is instead saying, and you alluded to this uh, earlier in the podcast, is that we're going to abolish the, the family as it is presently constituted, rooted in like private property, social relations, and under like the conditions of like present day capitalist society, which is far more modest than what the label is actually like entailing. And I think it's far more amenable to like a larger number of people. Yeah, we don't have to freak every Catholic out. We're probably gonna freak most of them out. But, yeah, um, unavoidable, but you know, I mean. Uh, well, this is it's... the point I bring up with like a lot of Catholics is that like when you actually read the Gospels, we're so used to thinking of Catholics as like, oh, we have to be pro-family. But when you read the Gospels, like every Which time Jesus totally brings up family, yeah, every time Jesus brings up the family, it's like very ambivalent. Um, I'm going to like uh, um, bring father against daughter, or like when he tells one of his disciples uh, to not go to his dad's funeral to to let the dead bury the dead. Uh, and a lot of Catholics tell me, oh, well, what about Mary? We consecrate Mary and, and that sort of thing. She's like the universal mother. And it's like, that's true. 
And that's, that's true, both in the sense that we do do that and that that's correct. But it's not just Jesus who calls Mary the mother, like mother. It's everybody. It's all Catholics because it's a corporate. It's far yeah. more complicated is what I'm trying to say. I, 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 I used to th- I used to really throw people out of the loop when I actually started taking seriously the gender argument uh, that an attempt to get past gender was actually monastic orders. And that, oh, uh, um, that it's not a new gender ex- exactly, but like um, marriage to an abstraction to take you out of social reproduction and to reduce. I mean, if you think about what you do as uh, as as someone in a monastic order, particularly in a Buddhist one, even more than a Christian one, but in both, um, you you remove all demarcators of. I mean, like you literally cut off the things that make it obvious. Your secondary sex characteristics are what you actually take aim at to remove your, your, yeah. your, your obvious householderness. You are um, no longer in the set of social relations in wider society that like indicate right. you as like a possessor, the possessed, or an object to be possessed, i.e., a male or a female. Right, and and I think you know, uh, interestingly, this was like some some transgender atheist friends of mine who pointed this out to me many many years ago. But it like, and I will say no. It is not truly the same as transgender or anything like that. I'm not arguing right. that, but I am arguing that there has always been uh, a kind of category for this kind of people in most societies, uh, less so for women than for men. Or, or let me use the correct nomenclature: less so for those assigned male at birth than those not assigned or and assigned. Less so for those assigned female at birth. Eh. Uh, and those not assigned female at birth, man, the nomenclature here, I will admit, is is somewhat intimidating sometimes. But um, I think it is accurate to say that we see both tendencies in, say, Christianity before it makes its weird retrograde movement in capital. I mean, it's not the first time, like, I want to do... I want to read a history about the class origins of and the class weird ass class dynamics in Christianity from a Marxist scholar who isn't also just like die hard, just trying to prove religion is awful because I mean, so what, what about, what about R.H. Tawney? Cause he wrote his, uh, wrote that book. I think R.H. Tawney's book is the closest thing we have to it actually. Um, okay. I was about uh, to say. um, but that's it. We don't have like, and I guess Roland Bohr, you know, our weird, our weird Marxist Leninist Calvinist, um, uh, you know, has a series on this. But in general, there hasn't been an analysis of like uh, the you know w- w- the weird class relations of Christianity because it wasn't actually the totally the underclass that it was attracted to that actually ended up being a myth. Nor was it the absolute pinnacle of power elites that was a myth either. And how it ends up reinforcing like, the roman empire it's like middle class that. tradesmen in the cities like right Peter and, and women about. and women right and a lot of women actually you know and uh and it was it was historically for the first four centuries highly deleterious to families which is part of why in the gospels i think you know from my dirty outsider perspective um uh, for those you know my mother was was Catholic, but I've never been Catholic in my life. Um, uh, that you have this strange uh, shifting around of class in Christianity that is both sympathetic towards the down, you know, ha, you know, has like what is it, salvistic preferential uh, preferentialness for the poor? I think it's the way Protestants will sometimes phrase it, um, except when they flip it and become the other kind who think that, you know, Saul is, uh, well, not Saul, um, King David is the model and you should have preferential power for the rich are the powerful because they're the people who run society. Um, but Christianity is interesting that way. Right. And Marxists generally kind of don't touch it. And they often, when they do touch it, they often sound sub new atheist in regards to like sociological literature. Yeah. Um, um, and, uh, I don't just say this as a person who has vaguely religious sympathies. I, I don't bring them into my Marxism at all. Um, uh, but, uh, I, I tend to think 
I tend to be a materialist and I, I, I argue that we live in a, uh, a multi-religious world. And so being religion neutral politically is, is at, at best a minimum. Um, uh, but uh, I find it interesting that that's going to be our big thing on these gender issues because this is where it is encoded, but it's also where weirdly there are outs in society already there. Like, um, I don't think we can argue, for example, that like Jesus was a pro transgender communist. I, I tend to think those arguments are also very, very stupid. That's looking but, backwards, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think you do have to deal with the fact that there's a lot in that book that social conservatives, that book being the Bible here, that social conservatives have to ignore. And there's a lot in Christian history that social conservatives have to ignore. And it's not just a Slavic preference towards the poor. Like, yeah, I mean, an important point that um, I have a very good friend of mine. Her name is Dorothea. She's she is a trans woman, but she is also a a big she's like Catholic she loves St. Tom Thomas. She's a she, she's a big Thomist. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the big points that she brings up, as well as one of my other friends um, brings up, is the fact that like a lot of social conservatives, at least in the United States, like political Catholics, white Catholics, I should say, talk about well, the Bible is very clear on like man and woman, Adam and Eve, that sort of thing. The church is very clear on that, I should say. Um, but even with the pronouncements of say. Pope Francis was very against gender gender ideology as well as previous popes. Like the, the fact of the matter is that like we've we've never really had a council like genuinely dealing with this. Like a lot of people have this misconception that whatever the Pope says sticks as doc dogma. Only so only ex only ex, ex cathedra on theology alone. Right. There are like and this is something that confuses a lot of people is that there are gradients of like, it depends on like what mode in which a Pope is speaking in. So like, and encyclicals have like different weight in like what you have to believe, depending on what's in the document, the mode of it. Papal infallibility has only been invoked twice, right? And they're both about Mary. Yes. Um, and the big point is that like, you can very easily interpret the story of Genesis as like, not in a literal fashion as in like, man and woman one has to be a man one has to be a woman but in the sense of like in the human race there are men and women but that doesn't preclude like being a woman psychologically in one one's mind in a male body and vice versa i mean i think there's you know i'm, I'm for me, the religious justifications of it are difficult. I come from a different set of traditions, but uh, I I studied religion pretty intensely, which is, I think, why maybe like uh, people uh, don't know what to do with a lot of what I say because like I can tell you how most Catholics don't understand how papal most Catholics don't understand how papal infallibility works. Much <laughs> less like Protestants who are like, well, that Pope was immoral, therefore no papal infallibility. I'm like, you don't understand the doctrine at all. Like, right. um, I mean, I don't agree with the doctrine personally. I'm not a Catholic, but like, it helps to understand that it's only ever been invoked twice. Um, and it's, it's, it's speaking ex cathedra on something that is dogma, but is not scripturally founded and you don't have a council on. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you have encyclicals about this stuff and that's interesting um uh i think ultimately we we're just gonna have to uh i i think we're gonna we have to admit that we're gonna get a lot of religious push back on this but we also have to admit that even if we're not materialist in our, in our like metaphysical beliefs um Marxian socialism has a, has at least a methodological, if not an ontological, materialist commitment, right? Yeah. Um, and um, I'm willing to fudge the ontological materialist commitment um, <laughs> because, you know, I, I think I think making a political stance based on metaphysical beliefs is a weird thing. It's like you know when you meet the Marxist, uh, usually trots, but sometimes the males who make you renounce the Big Bang, right? Before the Catholic you the way I deal with a lot of Catholics, because I get a lot of questions as a Catholic communist from fellow Catholics who are like, how can you do that? 
and one of the main questions they asked me is like, well, 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 Julian, Jules, how can you, how can you be Catholic and also like believe in Marxism? And I tell them, well, whenever I'm reading like Capital, like volume, volume two of Capital, and when Marx starts talking about how uh, the invalidity of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, I merely just skim over that part until he goes back to talking about political economy. The, the joke being that like, um, the, there's there's really not much connection between the two. It's like saying like, you can only believe in like, um, I don't know, uh, medicine if there is like a Catholic way of doing medicine. Like it doesn't right. make sense. And like, yes, it's true that like, I think Marxism necessarily means you have to be materialist ontologically, but there's a way you can very easily square that with there being a God or there being miracles. Uh, while also at the same time, like understanding that, like, that doesn't mean that like, there are social relations that are like inherently sacred beyond like maybe those within the church. And by right. sacred, I mean like you cannot question them they are completely mysterious, and they cannot be uh, uh, subverted. Yeah, I mean, maybe let's put a thumbnail on this because I think you and I having a discussion, even if it's only for my patrons, I'll decide uh, on um, on Marxism and religion, and mm. maybe a couple of texts to talk about that would be good because I I also tend to be closer to you on this than I think people realize. But um, uh, my my own spiritual background, in so much as I have one, is Judeo Buddhist. Um, you know the great heresy of the twentieth century. <laughs> um, but uh, I would say, as a person who's actually formally educated in religion, um, pretty thoroughly, uh, I can quote my encyclicals. Um, uh, my favorite one is to quote uh, Pio Nono talking about capitalism. Oh, I mean, he also is condemning socialism, but I'm just like, you know, you can't be a capitalist either, right? Like, if you're being truly papal about things, like... The thing like, I tell people, and there's a really good book on this called uh, The Troubled Origins of the Italian Labor Movement. It examines mm -hmm. the relationship between the late 19th, early 20th century Catholic, uh, not Catholic, but Italian labor movement with the papacy. And one of the funnier points that the author makes is about the references to St. Thomas about the uh, sacredness of private property that many popes and many bishops and theologians made at that time. The 19th century being a sort of rediscovery of St. Thomas and his writings. Uh, and the point uh, he makes is that like these popes and a lot of these bishops were not directly quoting Aquinas in many, many circumstances because what they were doing was essentially quoting manuals of manuals of summaries of manuals of St. Thomas's Summa. Like basically playing a 10, a five degree game of telephone and a lot of very important details and asterisks with respect to private property being left out, especially since St. Thomas was writing during 13th century feudal France, as opposed to 19th century industrial Europe. I was about to say, and one of the things is like, yeah, 13th century feudal France, you do see the beginnings of, of, of liberalism begin to creep up, but like, he ain't writing about that, man. Like, it's not really in the cards yet. Um, and private property actually means something different. Um, but yeah, let's put a pin in this because we're getting yes. really sidetracked right now. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about family stuff. Um, the way in which we have to deal with this, I think we've made this point over and over again. Um, if you don't deal with the class nature of the intersection of social reproduction and, and material reproduction, you will not be able to produce a classless society. And I, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a believer that classless society means that there's like, I'm not one of these people who go so far, who thinks that like a classless society means there's never a division of labor and, yeah. and you know, like, cause I'm just, that's impossible unless we all become other gatherers. But, um, I, I do believe all divisions of labor should be voluntary for the most part. Um, yeah, you're not trapped yeah. into that division of labor. Right. Um, that roles are temporary. They're not permanent. They're not, they're not positions of which you can hold. 
Uh, yeah. They're recallable. And that also means that if you take that seriously, that's going to change a lot of domestic stuff too. Because um, that applies to the sexual division of labor as well. Correct. And so if you take this stuff seriously, there are certain elements of family reproduction that do have to change. And, and that may be what we mean by family abolition. Um, and, and that's even true for now. But I, I don't think we need to freak out the normies by talking about how we're going to get rid of grandma. Right. Um, and to kind of put what you're talking about in, a, in, a, in, another, in other words, uh, Mark Sox has that, that very famous passage in the German ideology about like the division of labor where he says, um, under capitalism, one is either a hunter, one is a hunter, one is a fisherman, one is a carpenter. Under communism, one hunts in the morning, one then fishes in the afternoon, then one builds in the evening, and then one has intellectual discourse during supper. I mean, you know, as I, I tell people, this means that you have to do all the functions of the society. I also talk about, like, this means you have to do the functions that we assign to police and stuff like that. I think, yeah. for There's example... Yeah, talks about, right, in State and Revolution? Yeah. Uh, I actually talk about how I think having the police as a permanent position is morally corrupting. Not yes. just not just because of power, but also because you are exposed to the worst elements of society, no matter what. And that's it, it, and if that's all you are exposed to, it's going to fuck you up. And well, so, even from the standpoint of the person who enters the police force, you know, you know, a cab because because the nature of being a uh, of being a cop will change you, no matter who, no matter how good you are going in, and. And I think, like, one, it would remove a lot of violence from these functions, but two, although maybe not all of them, but two, it it also means that everybody has to do this kind of social, uh, or everybody's got at least, you know, no one's got, no one class of people is going to be stuck doing it all the time. It's basically right? by statistician, uh, like in ancient Athens. Right. Like you're going to have to do this every now and you're going to be called upon to do to deal with social problems. Hopefully in a social society, there's a fuck lot less of them. Yeah. Um, uh, and importantly, and I know you have a lot of problems with these two, but in Graeber and Wengrow's uh, Dawn of Everything, I think they do a very good job talking about, uh, and also Stephanie Kuntz as well, talking about the very different ways in which uh, different societies handle the policing of like problems like murder that we do. Which is to say, instead of like having a prison or a jail in which uh, defendants are put into and having this alienated form of like state policing, what essentially happens, at least in the like the northwest, northeast indigenous tribes like the Iroquois, is that the gens or the families, both blood and extended, like get together and talk about what uh, what. Re remunerations or what needs to be done to like settle these problems uh and i think this is to your point about like what it means to abolish the state and abolish the police um which is like making destroying that alienation between everybody else and the police which necessarily exists by virtue of like the state being like the overarching superstructure that like facilitates the coercion of labor i.e surplus value or surplus labor and synonymizing those policing functions of the police with the populace in general, which is what Lenin, in my, from what I remember, talks about in the state of the revolution of like yeah. arming the entire populace and making the two synonymous. Right. I mean, he also talks about the fact that there should be no standing armies and everybody should have military yes. training. I mean, like stuff like that, like stuff that actually even the U.S. family fa founding fathers played with, rightfully, I may mm -hmm. add, like. Because the moment you have a standing army, you have a you have a class that subsists off of surplus labor. That that's all they do, um, and yes, and get more specialized at it, you know. But you're trading that off on the, on the needs of having to support a class of killers that you have to maintain and also have to keep them from killing you. So it's it 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 is uh it, it the, the socialization of that like. I want people to hear this because we talk about this family. We're not talking about these functions going away. We're not talking about automating them because I don't believe you can in some cases. Like, there's certain social functions you just can't automate away. Um, 
and there's going to be ugly labor that we all have to do. Like, I don't want to lie to people about that and tell them it's not going to happen. There's just going to be a fuck lot less of it. And it's going to be no single person's job to be the only person who has to deal with it. Right. Like I, I talk about this in my, um, my latest essay in Substack about like, um, there's this, there's this quote that Marx talks about or like writes to a friend about like communism being essentially like, the revival of the archaic or peasant society, but on a higher plane or on different terms. What it essentially means is basically under, and I'm speaking very broadly and generally here, so there's going to be some vulgarization, is that like under peasant society, medieval Europe, you had like these corporate communities. By corporate, I mean like peasants being tied to the land and like a certain communization of labor, especially with like taking care of the land, the commons, and like with even with household units, like there being a somewhat equitable partnership between man and woman in taking care of the household. But this was not done under like conditions of filial, filial or piety or, or um, like fraternal brotherhood, but instead under like conditions of subsistence of like we have to do this to get by. Um, right. But then under lib not just liberalism, but also the rise of capital, you see the uprooting of those individuals and. What Marx talks about on the Jewish question, the separation of man from man. This is where natural rights come into play, where natural rights are essentially like the protection of like the individual's right to be left alone. So the right to having like private property, the right to like have your own religion, but be, but with the separation of man from man, that does not necessarily mean that like you're protected from being dominated by property. You're being, that you are protected from being dominated by religion. And so what communism kind of is, is the turning right side up of that separation between the political and the economic, or like the reconciliation between man with man, but on high, but on higher, higher terms of like the yeah, no longer on subsistence terms, right? That, that is why development is considered important. And, yes, because you know. with the development of the productive forces, now all that extremely rough, tough, um, like subsistence labor that peasants had to do is no longer there because we now have the ability to like uh, provide for everybody. But on like this time on these higher terms in which like um, we are able to, we are able to control like these incredible forces that we have cultivated throughout capitalism, uh, which frees us to basically do what Marx refers to as like, the universalization of our capacity for labor, the free play, right. essentially, of labor. And th there's another thing I would like to, for people who talk about this, because I always talk about degrowth and growth socialism has always been to me like a horrible framing. Yes, um, a thousand percent. Uh, even though, like, I guess in some ways I'm closer to the degrowthist and that I do think we have to slow down resource consumption yeah. on the planet. Uh, I, I also realize that we have to produce a whole lot to even do that um, <laughs> without killing off a ton of people. Um, so it's so, you know, and, and I think we have to think about this, though. It, it, we have all this productive capacity, but how much are we just building widgets and doing planned obsolescence? that we have older technology that would actually make that not necessary. And if we develop this new technology, not towards planned obsolescence, how much could we save, right? Instead of having to replace something every seven years, we could potentially keep certain things on the road and running for, I mean, you know, with an electric car, the, 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 the barriers entropy. Yeah. Like instead of, you know, an entropy where you have reduced parts and reduced components, to have to have systemic cascading failure so when you start thinking about stuff like that and like even the electric car isn't perfect because you should really be talking about electric public transit and uh, yeah. um and clean electricity and, and and this and the other but think about how much we can produce if we teleologically oriented it towards sustainability not towards generation of profits yes um a whole lot of our problems we would figure out like we would be able to figure out how to prevent nitrogen blooms happening in the ocean because we're overusing nitrogen fertilizers. We'd be able to figure this out. Uh, we'd have the capacity to do it. And, and, and Marxism does kind of argue that 
that for most people, capitalism had to happen for this to happen. And this is, I know people don't like that. I know that's like, that's the part of Marxism that people get mad about. Um, it is not actually, it is unclear whether Marx thought that that was, that every society needed to go through capitalism. It's pretty clear that he's at least flirting with the idea that they don't. Yeah. Um, uh, Engels sort of thinks that, kind of takes a half answer that like well capitalism had to happen but now that it's happened other people can piggyback off of it and not have to go through it like the russian peasants like before right 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 and then plakhanov kind of goes back and forth on that and then ultimately you know says no but you have to you don't want the problem of ink and development blah 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 like and then lenin has his answer where he essentially groups of plakhanov and then tries to force it through really fast um I say all that to say that, like, we also have to deal with that in the family because the, the devastation of these social structures and this alienation of these social structures in light of this has been profound. Yeah. Um, but in many ways, I was talking to Daniel Bitten about this. Even late capitalists, if you, period, because of the abundance, we actually have certain things where in which we are more like ancient hunter gatherers or early peasants than we are later peasants, like. Like the medieval period is more alien to us than like ancient ancient peoples, mm. because of relative equality between most people you meet. Now we have massive inequality between certain social strata in ways we never even fathomed before. But it excludes so many people from that that it's not really part of the equation in most people's daily life. Um, which is also part of why this is difficult to talk about. I mean, this um, is why. Um... When, when people ask me, like, where to get started on, like, reading socialism or communism, I tell them, like, well, obviously, number one, Marx, like, volume one, or, like, some of his pamphlets. But, like, after that, you should definitely read, for example, like, the, you should read the eco-socialists, essentially. So I'm talking about John Bellamy Foster, Andreas Malm, you know, Fossil Capital. Not sure if you read that. I know y'all, you and... um. I read Fossil Capital, and I've read... uh I read Ecology. Yeah, I've read Marx's Ecology and Robbery of, Robbery of Nature, which is his compilation of essays, is very good. Um, but like, you really the recovery of the ecological dimension of Marxism, I think, is like the most clearest um, articulation of like what communism is, because it's where there where like people like Foster and Malm essentially say like, well, communism is not necessarily like degrowth, like what communist what like what communists are like trying to say they're not trying to like institute what some would pejoratively call like barracks communism barracks communism or spoke or smokestack socialism Ugh. right or smokes most smokestack smokestack socialism. socialism um what basically what they mean is that like what we essentially mean when we talk about communism is that we're neither pro degrowth or anti-growth we are pro growth in some areas and pro degrowth in others which comes from the principle that like the important thing here is that like we need to control how we produce because even when you get to like the biggest guys biggest billionaires manufacturers on the planet jeff bezos or whomever whomever like they also have a boss that boss's name is the market they are producing but they are not producing out of like their own free will per se they are producing in order to keep up and like continue their reproduction through society like it is definitionally irrational production. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a key and major point, actually, that it is definitionally irrational production, even for them. And and uh, they can try to offset it later on in life, like most of them try to, but it's it's not going to work. So um, on that note. I guess we've kind of talked about a lot. Um, I think this has been both productive and meandering as our conversations tend to be, unless we're being very specific. <laughs> um, I think we should talk about Marxism and religion uh, in a couple of months. I'm, uh, I, I think people are going to get used to you on my channel being one of my every three or four month guests. Uh, I'll probably actually record with you more than that, but um, I, I spaced them out over so long a period of time. Um and uh, we might want to talk more specifically so that people can kind of get into the specific things we're talking about here. Uh, we've mentioned Melinda Cooper. We've mentioned a lot of the Marxist feminists. We've we've mentioned um, Robert Self. Um, yeah. 
uh, just to recap some people that maybe people should read. Uh, you've mentioned people I haven't read, too. Um, but we should probably talk about Marxism and religion and then maybe go a little bit more into the debates around Marxism and feminism, Marxist feminism, because, like, Federici, for example, is a person who I both love and hate in equal measure. Yeah, um, same. Uh, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, there, you know, there are other Marxist feminists uh, who who I love, and they're, Mar they're the Marxist feminists who gave a standpoint epistemology, which I've never forgiven them for. <laughs> so, um... another, another scholar who is excellent on this in terms of, like, understanding the family changing from, like, feudalism to capitalism from a Marxist conception, Wally Saccombe and his two-volume history, a, a Millennium of Family Change, and his second book, I think, yeah, called Weathering the Storm, both are fantastic. Excellent books if you want, like, a a very good um, Marxist introduction to the family that's not mechanical and also is very good add-ons to what Engels says as as to and also as well as corrections to some of his faulty anthropology. Yeah, I, there's a I'll make a list uh, for my patrons sometime. You and I, you and I can consult on that actually because there's some other books like uh, there's a book about 12 years ago uh from a from a trotskyist scholar in a history of marriage i think was quite useful i can't remember hmm. her name are you, um, talking about, uh, are you talking about um stephanie kuntz's uh marriage yes yes that duh stephanie kuntz duh, 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 duh. i have all three of her books on the family they're all fantastic she is yeah, also number, great her book uh the social relation the social origins of the private family not only a fantastic history of the family as it changes through like american history but also a fantastic history of like the demarcation or the creation of the private sphere as is like differentiated from the public sphere. Brilliant. Totally agree. I think, uh, I, I think the most accessible book she has is her, is her, her marriage history. I think that's, yeah, the, like, that's the accessible one for layman. With. The social origins one I just mentioned is more academic and can be very dry at points, but I think is excellent. Right. So, I always tell people get the accessible book first, and then when you really want to get into the notes of bolts, go read the actual monograph. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, you can get it at your library. And if you can't, well, there are ways to get books where you, should do that. you don't have to pay for them. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, use those ways. Some of them are even legal. Um, oh. So. Um, I, I would definitely, I was, I've, I couldn't remember if that was Stephanie Kuntz or not, but I was like that book when I read it, uh, God, it was 12 years ago when I read it, Man. it was very helpful <laughs> in my life to like conceptualize some things. Um, uh, actually I would actually, one thing I would say, I would pitch this to my male, uh, male listeners particularly, I think a lot of this socialist literature, you think it's going to make you feel bad or, or feel you know, like you're being hoodwinked or that like there's some kind of gender thing keeping you from focusing on class. I actually think if you read some of these books, uh, unlike most socialist theory, you could actually understand your own situation in a mm -hmm. way and your interpersonal relationships to be, to have a better life. And I do not normally, I, I do not sell that for most socialist literature, because frankly, it's usually not true. But uh, but on some of this stuff on marriage and on the way this has been used to control people uh, and um, its relationship to private property and the and what the kinds of policies you should or should not advocate for, um, they will also affect the way you interrelate with other people, and it will make it easier for you to get along with them. Um, if you feel particularly alienated from women and you're a heterosexual dude, uh, this might help you. It's really yeah, it's <laughs> sincerely. Like I, like Federici and Vogel and like the Marxist feminists, they're they're not man haters. Like they make it very clear throughout their books, whether like their single volume books like Caliban the Witch or Federici's collection of essays, Revolution at Point Zero. Like they make a very important point that like this is not just like oppressive for women, but also for men as well. And this also yeah. extends to um, a lot of black, black Marxist, not black Marxist scholarship, but um, like black scholarship on incarceration and like black, uh, you know, uh, oppression. Because like when I was a conservative, like self-identifying conservative in college, 
there were like a, a, there was like a canon of books that was kind of proffered by a lot of leftists, such as um, uh, the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And I kind of unconsciously thought like, oh, these are like anti. These are white hating books. Yeah, these are white hating books. But when you actually read like the new Jim Crow or Elizabeth Hinton's America on Fire or like basically any of those books that aren't like the, the grifter books, but by actual black academics, they are not at all that way. In fact, they're yeah. very much like sympathetic or like understand like a lot of the reason for like white reaction and like root that in like the material and social relations that like put the two races like against each other while at the same time not um making excuses for like the latter yeah it's this is not all settlers by jay sakai yeah, it's, it's not jay sakai stuff and it's also like also jay sakai stuff isn't even jay sakai stuff but, but yes but important <laughs> point don't pay attention to like the most and don't don't pay attention to the fact that the most annoying people you know on twitter like constantly throw these books at you they're actually very good you should read them yeah in fact sometimes i think the most important people on twitter have never read them also but, a really important point yeah um uh i mean the other thing i would say no it's not all white for jilly of robin d'angelo that's the one book that i would say really is a waste of your time yeah that's, but, a uh, book. that's for uh, dei corporate people right um uh, I, I I have even got uh, people have heard me say today. I would even go so far as to say, go read Abraham S. Kennedy's first book. Um, what is his first book? Stamp from the beginning. Well, his first popular book is Stamp from the Beginning, which I think is is really useful for Marxists to read as a popular history for how race was built um, mm. and its social economic origins, its origins in the end of medieval. Uh, and the beginning of early modern empires and the beginning of a different kind of international trade, not the international trade had, had well, I mean, there, there weren't really even nations yet, but like um, inter kingdom trade had ever really not happened uh, that, you know, there were no, they, we weren't dealing with autarkist fiefdoms pretty much ever, but um, th this, that book is very useful for seeing what happens in the 13th and 14th century and, uh, that really constructs race as we know it um, and is a good analog against pe like liberals who try to read race all the way back into like the ancient Roman empire, which <laughs> uh, 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 there are, there are some arguments for, but I think most of them are misguided. So right, um, because race is not a fixed category as we brought right, up. Right. It's a constantly changing, like product of changing social relations. Yeah. Um, uh, the deadest white men did not think of themselves as white. Let's just yeah. put it to you that way. Um, uh, and by that, I mean the ancient Greeks and the early Christian church fathers. So, um, they have a weird conception of race that came down to climate. <laughs> yeah. Um, climate Very and language. Climate um, and language, yes. Um, so, it's, it, it's interesting to go back and read those ancient text and realize. That they don't mean the same things we do. Or even, hell, read it. It's even weird when you get into the, the foundations of early modern race. When you're, oh. like, hearing people talk about, like, the German race and, like, these national races. And you're just like, what? And then like, you have, like, in the Spanish Empire, like, the, the Span like, the Spanish colonial government literally issuing, like, certificates to mulatto saying, like, I am white. Oh, no. I, I love... I, I, I used to teach social studies. I used to be like, look, in the caste system, you can literally get a rid of whiteness. Like, <laughs> like, like you, you politically speaking, you are treated as X. Uh, and also the caste system is weird because they're mixed. Like, it's not just what race is your parents, but where are they born? Because like Spanish Moors are above a lot of white people. Like it's, it's, it's yeah. wild. This is something um, in Alan Taylor's Re American Revolutions where like there's this weird conception with British people where like they while the Spanish were much more hierarchical and much more kind of oppressive or authoritarian, they saw race as far more of a gradient and therefore like less of an oppressive. Hence colorism, thing. not race binary. <laughs> like, right. Whereas in the British colonies, like it was more democratic in the sense that they had these national assemblies, but at the same time, race was a far starker social category due to different social material conditions 
and historical contingencies that happened that made it that way. Yeah, I, I would say uh, the difference in the, the, the number of, of people, the, the fact that smallpox had wiped out a bunch of the indigenous people when they came, uh, the ambivalence that Protestants had um, about whether or not non-white people were people and way Catholic doctrine really made it. Po- Catholic and Orthodox Christianity had made that a heresy, but that was not a heresy in all Protestant Christianity. Um, hence weird stuff like the Curse of Ham stuff and yeah. uh, uh, multi, multi-origins multi of humanity stuff, um, which was a theological debate in the United States, uh, but is unique to Protestants. Um, well, you, but you the, to, oh, go ahead. No, but it, all these sounds cultural, but I'd also like to point out that like there are also material reasons backing up why this was a viable way of viewing the world for them. Um, yeah. So, yeah. If you want some good books on this for your audience, um, I recommend Alan Taylor's uh, American Colonies for like the formation of like these kind of modernish uh, conceptions of race, as well as Theodore Theodore Allen's two volume uh, set, The Invention of the White Race, specifically the second volume, which talks about uh, Bacon's Rebellion and then the Amer- American Colonies. The first one is about the I- the British oppression and colonization of the Irish. In the thir- starting in the 13th century and how the Irish are made out into a different race and how that was applied later in the American colonies. Uh, ironically, uh, that book plus BB not BB Netanyahu's but BB Netanyahu's father's book on the Spanish Inquisition are the two best books I have on the origin of European conceptions of race. That's um, so I did not. That's so funny. Oh my uh, god! Uh, Netanyahu's father who talks about. Um, uh, Maranization and the new Christians being the other origin of it because you had uh, religion treated as a bloodline problem because of the development of uh, of a petite bourgeoisie and a conflict over land in the in the home of the Spanish Empire. Oh, um, interesting. Okay, I'm gonna put. So you work. take those two books together, and you have like, okay, this is why British people did it. This is why the rest of the Europeans did it. Go. Um, oh yeah, I would. Even though, even though. You know the Netanyahu's are evil, but yes, of course. Uh, um, uh, this is not Bibi's. This is Bibi's father, and it's an old book. Um, but his histories of the Spanish Inquisition. I can't remember the name of it. I read it like I'll, I'll look it up. Um, uh, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna invite Jules uh, to help me create a couple of Patreon lists for this. And by Patreon list, means I'm gonna post it on Patreon, but I may make it open to the public and free. Um, it'll just be where I house this. Um, where we make a couple of reading list on on these issues because I think it would help people e- even to know what they're agreeing or disagreeing with. Um, uh, because I do think we need to have a better answer than yeah. race or class reductionism. Um, and even if I am class first, I am not class only in my analysis. So because um, uh, race race is very helpful in kind of creating. Uh, or refracting uh, class politics. Yep, it's very useful, which is why I always talk about like the first woke use of uh, uh, of uh, of um, uh, the first deliberately woke framed use of uh, black scabs, which was against the Manx and Cornish uh, work uh, miners in Carnegie, uh, mm-hmm. which actually pushed the Cornish and Manx to identify with wasps. Thus, expanding the category of whiteness. Um, what, book and did, all, what book did you get that from? Because I've heard that a couple times. Uh, believe it or not, I think I just got it from a general history of the time period, and then and then Robert Evans of all people covered it, and and he lists a, a bunch of books. But it's uh, uh, I remember reading it. I think in just a biography of Carnegie. Gotcha. Um, that makes sense. Um, I, I got to find which one, but it wasn't by, I didn't read it by a Marxist. It was just something that I read. I was like, whoa, they've been at this a long time. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll also uh, send you my good friend, Richard Hunsinger's book. I love him. He's, he's a wonderful guy. Um, he's been doing some really fantastic scholarship on like the formation of race as it pertains to class. He actually just recently uh, released this really excellent essay uh, critiquing Eric Foner's reconstruction and comparing that to Du Bois's black reconstruction and talking about the latter as like, what makes the latter more useful than the former? Not to say that the former is bad, but what makes it even more useful to Marxists is that the latter with Du Bois's book 
is like trying to create a logic of American history, specifically rooted in class and race, whereas Reconstruction like is a little bit more deficient in that regard, even though it's still excellent scholarship. Yeah, I mean, Fodor is kind of a Marxist, but not really. I mean, you know, <laughs> a lot of people from that time period. Um, uh, which is not to me I actually love Foner scholarship, but I, I agree with you that, that Du Bois is actually superior, even though it's older. Um, uh, and I, I, I think uh, Rodiger and other people like that are actually useful because they pick up on Du Bois scholarship, even though, like you know, Du Bois has some problematic stances. I mean, depending on the period that you're talking about, he changes um, a lot. He was a diehard Stalinist for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and it led him to weird stuff like trying to make excuses for the Japanese Empire. <laughs> but, Jesus. Uh, uh, that was a Stalin thing for a little while. Um, abandoned pretty quickly, though, um, even in the common term. Uh, all that said, we're going to end up today. We, we, we've been all over the place. Uh, Jules, thank you for coming on. You're going to be a regular on the show. Um, so um, I hope people use this to construct a more useful way of framing and notice. We didn't give you an answer to all these problems. We just pointed out that it's complicated and maybe we should treat it complicatedly. Right. Um, we'll, we'll compile those reading lists for y'all. Uh, and then we'll talk. Maybe we'll have a thing on race and a thing on Marx. And they religion. haven't broke your use of y'all yet. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, I only really start code switching once I go south of the Mason Dixon. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's funny. Um, it, it's, uh, it took me, uh, I don't want to get off a tangent. I actually, I'm actually like Southerners keep your accents if best you can, but don't also don't make it a cartoon. Like, yeah. Don't go uh, leg, leghorn or yeah. like you're about to protest the you know, Brown v. Board decision on the state house doors of like Arkansas. Yeah, don't do that. But you you can still say y'all. It's okay. It's cool. All right. Um. All right. With that. Good night. Good night. Uh,